much for coming. Uh, my name is Kim Smith and I'm with the Wyndham Regional Commission. Uh, in addition to our speakers, we also have a number of other uh, co-sponsors that I want to acknowledge and thank for their support. One is Jolene Hamilton with the Wyndham County Natural Resources Conservation District. Uh, Bill Gunther, County Forester, provided a lot of support. The Conservation Commission with the Town of Brattleboro and the Natural Resources Commission with the Wyndham Regional Commission provided a lot of vision and support in, in bringing this whole event together. So, um, And then finally, the Vermont Local Roads Program um, is offering Road Scholar support. They did a lot of outreach work for us. Um, so I just want to thank um, all of them, plus our speakers, for making this possible today. Um, in the back, we've got some handouts that you can take along with you, as well as sign-in sheets. Um, if you uh, would like uh, the Rhodes Scholar credits today, um, I, if you check your box, I'll send that to the, the um, VTrans Rhodes Scholar credit program, and uh, they will enter your names in, in the database. We have restrooms over here through this door. Uh, there's plenty of food back there. Please help yourself. Um, anytime during during the day today. Um, we'll be here until about noon and then um, right around noon towards the end of the program uh, there are some ash trees outside so we can take a short walk um, and do some identification um, if that would be helpful for those, those who want to join us. Um, we have three speakers today. Uh, the first one we'll start off with Molly Claypack and uh, she will be talking about um, identification and the importance of planning for the EAB. Um, she is a forest pest outreach coordinator for the University of Vermont Extension. Uh, we also have Bob Everingham who will be providing insight and his own personal experience in working with the town of Brattleboro to develop an EAB plan for the town. Um, so he's got a lot of personal experience as to how they've addressed this. And then finally we've got Jim Esden over here. Um, He's a forester, too, for the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. And he will be talking about all of the planning and implementation that it takes to, um, to deal with the, the emerald ash borer. Um, as many of you know, the emerald ash borer um, it has been devastating to ash tree populations. Um, and that could have huge ramifications for public infrastructure as well as the ecology of our forests. So, Thank you all very much for coming today, and I will turn it over to our speakers. So hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, again, I'm Molly Claypack from Museum Extension, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the emerald ash borer is, where it came from, where it is in the United States, as far as we know, and um, its biology. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so the emerald ash borer is a non-native insect. It's not from the United States. It's from China and Asia, um, and it kills ash trees. It um, is very effective at, at killing nearly 100% of our forest and um, urban grown ash trees um, in the United States. As you can see by this photo um, taken in Ohio, within just a span of three years, this, tr this street lined in ash trees is been completely killed. Um, they work very rapidly because they feed on the layer of um, wood just under the bark, the phloem, cambium, and just into the xylem layer of the tree, which is where the tree moves water and nutrients up and down. The larval stage of this insect, they feed on that layer of the tree. And so they essentially strangle it and prevent nutrients from moving up and down the tree. And so um, once enough insects live in a tree, it very quickly die, start starving from, from nutrients and water. And so um, that's, the, that's the threat that this bug poses to us, is killing nearly 100% of our ash tree population. Uh, these bugs got here, like a lot of forest pests, from the globalized transportation of wood material. Um, we believe that the emerald ash borer came from Asia on a shipment of solid wood packing material. Um, into the Detroit area where it was first discovered in 2002. Um, and so by moving wood around the world, we're moving the insects that live on that wood along with it. So um, that's an area that we're working to address, but as you can imagine, it's very complex and 
involves a lot of partner organizations. Um, once in this country, the Emerald Ash Borer has gotten rapidly moved around um, by transporting wood material, um, largely firewood. Um, citizens going camping or um, bringing it up to their second home have rapidly moved this insect around the country. The insects themselves are, they can only fly about one or two miles a year, but we've spread it hundreds of miles in just the last 13 years that it's been in this country by moving wood ourselves. The, the bug attacks all species of ash trees, and um, we have a number of different species of ash in um, the United States. This is a map of a generalized distribution of the genus of ash, and you can see that it takes over half of the continental United States. It's a very widespread group of trees. Um, here in Vermont, we have three native species of ash. We have um, white ash, green ash, and black ash. And they're characterized by a compound leaf. They have, it's a leaf with, made up of many different distinct leaf splits. Um, and they have fruit that are called samaras. Um, they're, uh, they're like maple fruit, but they come individually. And they have a very <clears throat> beautiful um, gray diamond-shaped bark. Um, so they're commonly found throughout Vermont. About one in every 12 trees in our forest is Vermont. Is, is an ash tree, about 7%. Um, but they grow well in disturbed landscapes, so we find them along roadways um, more often than um, in, the, in the forest interior. I also forgot to say that if you, um, please interrupt me any time to ask questions. Um, here's a map of the distribution of ash in Vermont, um, both red and green ash. It's, as you can see, it's, it's in no one place in particular doesn't make up a heavy population, but it's found throughout the state. Um, here is a map of the known um, locations of the emerald ash borer at this time. As you can see, the, the population really started in the Midwest. It was first discovered in 2002 in the Detroit area, um, and in the 13 year period, it has spread throughout the eastern United States. Now there are several interesting things about this map, and one of my um, things I think find most interesting are these sat satellite populations that are far flung from the real core of the infestation in the Midwest. And those populations <coughs> clearly illustrate that it is humans moving um, the population of the insect around. The insect didn't fly to Colorado over Kansas because they didn't like the Kansas trees. They were clearly brought in by um, by someone moving wood material into Colorado. Yeah. It's um, it looks like I can't really see it real well from here, but it looks like there's a lot in New Hampshire at this point, as far as we know, and then for that matter, Quebec and New York and everywhere around us. But yeah, that is the so other. When I look at that, it seems improbable to me, yeah. frankly, to think that it's not here. Yeah. That is the, so. the other really interesting thing about this map. Um, it is very likely that emerald ash borer is here. If it's not here, it's, it's very likely that it will come here in the next few years. That's what we are expecting. Um, as I'll show later, a little later, the emerald ash borer is actually very hard to detect. It's a very small insect. The signs of the insect are hard to detect and easily confused with other um, tree-borne problems. And so other places that have the insect have found that it has taken a number of years of the infestation building before they discover it. And so um, we are expecting that it will be here soon. We are surrounded by infestations, and it's, it's just a matter of time before we find it. Yeah. Is there another question over here? The same question. Yeah. Yeah, so we are looking very hard for the emerald ash borer. We have a number of different detection techniques that we use. Um, you've probably seen the purple traps hanging out all over the state. Those are a way to detect um, the population. We, we set up trap trees to, and um, use those to look for an infestation. Um, and so we've been looking really diligently, but we just haven't found it yet. Um, so another question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. If if we say if I thought there was some 
should I contact yeah, you? Yeah, definitely. And at the end of my talk, I'll show you. Because I think we've seen this already right, grafted. Uh, yeah. I cut wood and, and uh, actually, unless here, we, we, the, the B in this book here, it looks uh -huh. just like that. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll show you um, where to report it. Okay, all right. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, so the bug itself is a beautiful metallic green bug that is bullet shaped with a flattened head. And I'll pass around some um, live samples of it um, for your inspection. Um, it is a beautiful bug, however, it's very small. And so we often take these blown up pictures to make them look really um, pretty, but it's actually a tiny little insect. It's only about, it only gets up to maybe half an inch. Um, so they're, they're actually kind of hard to tell that they're green, and um, they're you know, they're a small bug that's easy to miss. Um, and there are some native bugs that can look a lot like it. Um, so we encourage everyone to report um, sightings. So far, we've only gotten um, sightings of adults as um, native lookalikes. Um, a common one to get confused with is the six-spotted tiger beetle, which is also a beautiful metallic green color. Um, but if you compare the two images, um, their body shape, the length of their legs, the shape of their head are all different. Um, so we love to get we love to get incorrect reports, um, but so far we haven't we haven't had a report of, a, of an actual emerald ash borer. The, the photograph of the emerald ash borer there, um, it, you don't see any legs at all. Does it? I mean, I assume it has legs. It does. Um, yeah. If you want to go back two slides. Or yeah, yeah. It, it does have a tiny little legs, but it kind of, I, I haven't actually seen a real one besides the sample we're passing around, but they kind of stay more under their the profile yeah. of their body, so they're not as obvious as the Any other questions? Okay, so that's what the adult looks like. Um, shiny metallic green, bullet-shaped body. Um, the larva, which is actually, it, the insect spends most of its lifetime as a larva, um, is, and this is the agent that actually kills the tree because it lives inside the bark layer heating that phloem cambium layer of the tree. Um, the larva gets to be a bit bigger, maybe about an inch long, um, and it's distinctive because it has these um, bell-shaped body segments. It's broken up into a number of these bell-shaped segments. Um, and there are a lot of wood boring insects in Vermont, but the bell shape of their segments is distinctive. Um, and as I said, they, they just live in that layer right under the bark um, while they're feeding. They don't, they don't bore into the heartwood like other um, larval um, bugs that might, might be a problem. So the life cycle of an emerald ash borer, the adult lays its eggs on the bark in um, midsummer around July. Um, the eggs hatch in about a week to 10 days, and the larva pours its way into the phloem layer of the, of the tree. There they spend the late summer and fall um, feeding on the phloem cambium layer, um, eating its pathway, as we call these galleries, under, um, under the bark. And the emerald ash borer is distinctive because they chew a snake-shaped gallery, an S-shaped um, pathway under the bark. And as I said, there are a lot of other wood-boring insects, but this serpentine pathway is distinctive of emerald ash borer. So these are samples of the galleries. Um, the, these trees were very heavily um, infested, and so there's lots of crisscrossing galleries. But if you if you look carefully, you can see where the where the larva turned, and it's very it's a very um, sharp S shaped turn that it made. Um, so they spend the into the winter feeding on the cambium layer of the tree. They um, pupate inside the tree as um, pre pupae, um, and they can overwinter. And they are 
fairly hardy, so they can withstand our um, fairly cold winters that are from the temperate region in Asia. And so they overwinter inside the tree, pupate in early spring, and the adults will emerge in um, May or June. Yeah. Fairly hardy. Um, is, is there any chance that the, this last February, which did I hear correctly, it was the first of February without a day over freezing, above freezing. Is that any chance that that'll slow them down? I believe, this would be a good question for Jim, um, but I believe that it it has to reach like negative 37 for a sustained amount of time for them to be killed. I'll ask Jim when he gets back to those. But I, I believe that the likelihood that our winter would kill them. Yeah, and they've been doing fine, you know, north of us. They, you know, they overwinter sort of huddled in the, in the, the yeah. bark, so they're fairly protected. Temperature-wise. Jim, can you speak to um, the how cold hardy the emerald ash borer is and whether this winter could have had an impact on their population? No, this winter didn't have any impact at all. Uh, last year with the polar vortex uh, populations of uh, this insect in Minnesota and Michigan areas like that were exposed to 30 below and worse and they survived. Any other questions? Okay, so that's the life cycle of the emerald ash borer. It takes them a full year to have one generation. Uh, here are a few pictures of their um, larval feeding galleries. Um, as I said, this is what actually kills the tree, um, and, it's, and it's these S-shaped um, serpentine uh, galleries that is distinctive to this bug. Yeah. So did it kill the bark off, or would you see the bark dropping off? Um, I'll show you in a second. The, the tree actually does start to split open, and you get a hint of those um, galleries. But um, yeah, if you see a tree that you think might be infested, one way to um, start to confirm an infestation is to peel off the bark on the other galleries. Another question here. Oh yeah. Are there any other Vermont insects that you know of that would create something similar to that for comparative purposes, or is it really that distinct to the emerald ash borer? You know, <clears throat> I, I can speak to that. On ash trees, there are other beetles that will uh, get under the bark and create tunnels like that, but they're not S-shaped. In ash trees in Vermont, the S-shaped gallery is a, is a diagnostic feature. <clears throat> so the adults emerge in June or Ju um, May or June through D-shaped exit holes, and that's also distinctive of the emerald ash borer. It's a, it's a very flat, flat on one side and curved on the other, um, very D-shaped, and that's a, also a diagnostic of the emerald ash borer. Um, so here are a few samples of them. Unfortunately, these exit holes are tiny, only a few millimeters, um, and they don't come pre um, colored in red, and so they're extremely hard to see. So although they are distinctive, um, it's very unlikely that we will be able to see them until the population reaches a, a massive level. The, the infestations also tend to happen at the top of the tree first and then work their way down, and so that makes it even more unlikely that we'll be able to spot these tiny exit holes. So since the since the exit holes and the larval galleries are so hard to see, being first tiny and under the bark, it's very important that we um, know the signs and symptoms of a tree under attack so that we can look at, look at a tree and um, see that there's some indication that there might be an infestation. So the following um, slides are pictures of the symptoms of a tree under an emerald ash borer. So ash trees. Is that, how long does that take? A um, year or two? I would say bark would begin to split a year after the the galleries are made. Perhaps depending on if the galleries are started early in the season, maybe by the end of the growing season, the the bark may begin to split. So the the bark will begin to split in the tree, and that may expose some of those galleries. Great um, sign of an infestation. So I have a few slides of 
pictures of bark splitting. Um, woodpeckers, our native woodpeckers, will start to go after the larva living under the bark. Um, unfortunately, they don't go after them intensely enough to actually be a method of control, but um, the signs of their feeding can be a good indication that there's some kind of bug pressure inside the tree that's worth taking a look at. And so their, their feeding process, um, stripping away the bark, creates a blonding effect that's visible um, from the ground. So if you see an ash tree that has a lot of woodpecker activity, that definitely merits um, a closer examination. So um, yeah, it's really that lightening of the bark um, that, that's very obvious um, and has been important for other states to identify. That's an important one to be aware of. Um, a stressed ash tree will also start to send out epicormic branching or water sprouts. Um, they'll send out these kind of bushy branches from, from their trunk or from their base. Um, and it's a sign of an ash tree that's under stress. Um, it's not diagnostic of an emerald ash borer infestation. There's another ash tree disease called ash yellows that will also cause the, the tree to epicormically uh, sprout but it is a sign that your tree's under stress and, and you might want to take a closer look at why that might be occurring. And the canopy will also start to thin as the um, larvae start eating away um, at the branches, they will start to die back. And so the canopy will start to thin, especially at the top of the tree. And so that is another great indication. So those are the major signs and symptoms. Um, does anyone have any questions about those in particular? I just gave you a lot of information very quickly. Um, obviously, there's a lot to know about this insect, and researchers have been um, busy um, finding out a lot about this pest. And um, a great place you can go to learn more is btinvasive.org. I have it written down on that um, piece of paper, um, so you can write it down at your leisure. But it's a one-stop shop website for all invasive organism information. So um, insect pests, plant organisms, aquatics, this, this is the website to go for information in Vermont. Um, so if you want to find out more about tree pests or emerald ash in particular, um, just click on the tree pest tab at the top left of the page and that will bring you to um, all the, all the important tree pests in Vermont, and one of them will be Emerald Ash Borer, and you can find out a lot more information about the bugs. Uh, from an isolated ash tree, how soon would you expect it to spread to another population of ash trees? Like, it's, if it's just, if it's just standing, standing there by the road by itself and not surrounded by any other ash trees. I, I'm not sure of a, a specific, you know, scientific study with, with empirical data like that, but I can tell you that um, there was an infestation that was very well documented in terms of when it was established, when uh, some infested material was illegally shipped to a nursery down in the Atlantic, mid-Atlantic states, and so they were able to... Um, observe carefully how the infestation spread from that very well-known spot, that nursery. And um, they were able to, to document a natural rate of spread of about a half a mile per year. That, that's, that's, you know, maybe give you a, a sense of rate of spread. It will depend on how densely uh, uh, populated the area is with ash trees. It would also depend on um, how many insects in the tree. Uh, when a tree is early on and the, the pest pressure is not very great, they don't necessarily need to leave. But as they begin to uh, impact the tree and the tree begins to decline, uh, then they, the insect would begin to look for greener pastures, so to speak, and, and, and fly away. Um. Great. So this is this is the website to go for more information. Um, it's also the place to go for um, reporting any infestations that you find. Um, 
right on the home screen, there is this report it section, and if you have a test that you would like to report, you just click on the test tape, test button, and it'll bring you to a page that has more information, it'll help you confirm your sighting, and then we'll give you either a phone number and or a online way to submit a photo or um, a statement about what you found. And we take those very seriously. We'll um, review them and be out to your site to look at an infestation. Um, we're really doing a lot of public education and outreach because we know it's very important to have partnership with all of our citizens and, and organizations so that we can find those pests as early as possible. Because although we think that it is just a matter of time before the dashboard gets here, if we can have an early detection and know as soon as it, we can that it's here, we have a lot more management um, options and we can be much more in control of the process. Um, and so it's really important that we find it early. Great, so that is my overview of biology and history. So I'll pause for any questions about that part of the, the talk today. Of course, bring them up later, but this is a moment for more questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Most of your uh, examples were trees that have pretty much had to radish at that point. Um, can you give us a little information on uh, what's being done to monitor them without looking at the trees? And I'm talking about the Ciceros wasp. Yeah, yeah. So um, we are doing a bunch of different monitoring um, stuff, and the one you mentioned is a really interesting um, technique where we use a native wasp that um, preys on group crested beetles, which is a one, which is a type of beetle which includes the emerald ash borer, but also some native beetles that live in Vermont. And so we have identified. Um, nests of this wasp, and fortunately, they, they tend to nest in sandy soil, such as the, um, the soil that's in ball pits. And so, we can go to local um, baseball pitches and find these nests. And so, we have volunteers that could go in and they monitor these nests and they look at the beetles that these wasps are catching. And if um, we can find 50 prey items that the wasp has caught, and none of them are emerald ash borer, scientists have decided that that's the threshold at which you can that there's no emerald ash borer in that beer area. So the wasp is acting as a little um, natural monitor for us in um, looking for the emerald ash borer. Um, so besides that, we are putting up the purple traps. We have thousands of those around the state, and they, um, they are designed to mimic an ash tree. The shape of them mimics a, the, the um, shape of a trunk. They have these uh, pheromone cards inside them that um, put out the chemical of a stressed ash tree. These insects are attracted to stressed trees before um, healthy trees, and so the trap sends out the smell of a stressed tree. And the purple is, for some reason, attractive to emerald ash borer. We don't really know why, but they like purple. Can I? Yeah. Um, there's actually been some, some recent developments in trap technology uh, the purple is a wavelength of light that the insect is attracted to. It turns out that emerald ash borer is attracted to both its food and its mates primarily by visual cues, more so than by olfactory cues. Well, I should say olfactory cues. Um, so, so the purple, they somehow discovered as a wavelength that, that they're attracted to. Recent studies have shown that they are also attracted to uh, another color, a, a very pale green, which, believe it or not, it's just like emerging foliage, which the adults would feed on. And so newer traps are now uh, either purple or green, a light kind of a, a, a lime green sort of color. And in addition to the cards that Molly mentioned that, that have the, the scent of a stressed tree, recently scientists have discovered a short range female pheromone, which is a brand new development. Uh, for the first 10 years or so of dealing with emerald ash borer, there was no known sexual attractant. And, and now they have one. Um, so newer traps have a different design, they're a different color, and in addition to the the Munuka oil that 
smells like a stressed tree. They also have this short-range female pheromone. And, and these traps, in many cases, uh, seem to be more effective than the traditional prism-shaped purple traps. Do you have an example of the trap? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an example, no. So the trap is covered in a really sticky um, substance, and anything that flies into it is stuck to it, and we look at it twice a year to see if any and we've been looking at them twice a year for a number of years now, and we haven't found any. So, where do they go when they eat on the ashtrays? That is a great, that's a great question, and scientists in the Midwest are just starting to really dig into that, because they've had them for a significant amount of time, and they are looking at, like, what water composition should go um, once they've eaten all their food source. Um, we have just recently discovered that they have moved into the white fringe tree, um, which is in the same family as ash, but not the same genus. It's called the white fringe tree. Um, it's not in Vermont, but um, it's that's a concerning development that it's, it's not restricted to the Fraxinus genus. It can be in, in other genuses, and so um, that's that's a great question that scientists are just researching what will happen to the population. Yeah. supposed to be here and uh, and they will eventually eat themselves out of house and home and move on to new ash trees and the big question will be what happens when all the ash trees are gone and so we are trying to conserve uh, germplasm we're, we're saving seeds uh, there's a great deal of research that's being done about uh, mechanisms of resistance in ash trees uh, out in the Midwest there is a phenomenon known as lingering ash and somewhere around two to three uh, out of a thousand trees are seeming to survive as the wave of infestation goes by there are some trees that while maybe infested are still alive they, they haven't um, been they haven't succumbed and so um, there's a great deal of research being done on the mechanisms of resistance and the hope is that we may be able to figure out that and do maybe some kind of breeding program like they've done with the chestnuts. Um, we may be able to, to produce trees that are more resistant. And, and I don't mean to take too much time here, but the other, the other hope, honestly, is, is that um, there are some um, parasitoids, there are some biocontrols um, that might prove helpful but they take so long to get established and become effective, and emerald ash borer kills trees so quickly that so far it's been hard to kind of get ahead of the ball with, with parasitoids. And, and the thought is that, um, that perhaps what's going to happen is that this cohort of ash trees that exists right now is going to get wiped out. But there will be that lingering ash. There will be those, those survivors. Um, that may be able to be protected by the parasitoids. If we can keep the parasitoids in place, the, the, the general population of ash trees will crash, so the general population of emerald ash borer would crash. And then if we can introduce the parasitoids, when the, when the insect pest levels are real low, they may be able to, to climb with the population of the, of the pest and keep it in balance. That, that's sort of one of the working theories right now. And, and the other is, you know, that if we can slow the spread, maybe science will learn some other uh, real helpful, effective tool. In a lot of ways, we're, we're very lucky to be at, the end, be at the end of the line. I can't hear you. Oh, I can't hear you. In many ways, we're very yes, lucky. We we're very lucky in Vermont to be at the end of the line. We've had these 13 years to learn from other people's experiences. And and the parasitoids choice is an example of what we're hoping to learn. 
I don't think Gallery maybe you're more pressed for time. I was wondering, Jim, though, if it, for the lingering trees, are there any conclusions, assumptions, you know, what it is about why those those ones, individuals, might survive? Or I'm not aware of details right now. Um, okay. I know that it's being very aggressively uh, researched, but yeah. I, I just don't know the details. You know, silviculturally speaking, I wonder, if, you know, do you? As foresters, of course, you do, do you go in and get ahead of it and harvest them all now, or if, if, there's a chance, if, if say, for example, the lingering tree had shown that the, the ones that survived were those that were healthier, more robust, or something, then maybe you could make a case for, for, for piecing all of your ash trees or something to make sure that they had you know, maximum nutrient and life. And Water yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Your genetic population, then you want as many ash trees as possible. And that. Right. Right. Because yeah, you're only going to get to keep two tenths of a percent. Yeah. Right now, we don't know how to predict or how to how to recognize which trees will be those resistant ones. Um, so as as soon as we find out, we want yeah. everybody to know. But right now, I just don't have any. <laughs> Uh, obviously, where these invasives came from, there's still ash trees. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting contaminated wood. Um, so, what is the difference between our ash trees and those ash trees? Evolution. Uh, yeah, it's, it's evolution. They have evolved in the system, and so the tree has natural defenses and the pest as predators. So it's just a, it's a balance that we don't have here. Um, and so we, we've gotten many of the parasitoids by going over to Asia and finding them and, and bringing them back. So um, there's been a lot of a lot of research in China about, about the balance that's been created and how we can maybe replicate it here. So, so is that more dependent on the parasitoids or the uh, some feature of the local ash in China. I, I honestly can't say which one's more important. Um, you know, certainly there are many variables in that equation. I do know that the Asian species of ash are, are significantly resistant. They are also uh, are the parasitoids and so forth. I, I can't tell you which is more important. Because, you know, the, the natural next question is, well, why not go out go over to Asia and buy a couple of sacks full of seeds or seedlings and bring them here? Well, then you're introducing a non-native species. <laughs> so yeah. th there, there's, there's work being done with, again, trying to breed resistant trees with our native that aren't so resistant. All that's being investigated. Yeah. We didn't know basically anything about this volume in 2007. All this is kind of new information. Um, I just heard, though, uh, that uh, it looks like blue ash, a, a native ash, is showing some resistance to it. I don't know if you guys have heard more about that, but, you know, there's people looking at that, too. Which isn't one of our ash in Vermont, but... The three in Vermont are the white, the green, and the black. Yeah. There's no more questions. I'll move on to the next section so we stay on time. Um, and Bob will be um, joining me, um, chiming in as in this section. Um, he is a um, ISA certified arborist and um, owns a company called All About Trees. And he's also a member of our um, the urban and community forestry programs um, volunteer program called Volunteer First Detectors um, or Forest Pest First Detectors, um, and they are citizens who have been trained about these issues and have been um, tremendously important in educating the public and, and being our eyes on the ground looking for the pests. So um, that's a really important component of our program. So now that we know about the insect, um, we're going to move into the main part of today's presentation, municipal planning for, for the reality of the emerald ash borer. So I'm just going to cover why it's important and um, why we should care. So, um, here in the United States, we've dealt with similar um, problems of um, invasive pests that have killed native trees. The chestnut blight, the Dutch elm disease have killed 
um, our beloved um, American chestnut and American elm, and we perhaps did not deal with that um, those episodes as efficiently and strategically as we could have, and so we're trying to learn from those past mistakes and be more proactive as we're dealing with the new wave of, of pest with the emerald ash borer. So, um, with that moving on, um, before I get into details, let's, let's talk about why we care about our trees, particularly trees that grow in our communities, in our, um, in our towns, and the benefits they provide us. Um, Trees actually um, have a measurable increase in, in property values. They add value to our houses and our downtowns. Um, they have measurable ecological services that they provide us. They're actually now being thought of as infrastructure in our communities. Um, they capture and um, clean and slow down stormwater. They um, shade our houses and reduce our energy usage. They clean our air and make our communities healthier places to live. So it's been estimated that there are about 11.9 million trees in our communities, um, in our town centers, and collectively, every year, they provide us about um, $68 billion of services. Um, so they are a tremendous component of what makes our communities the vibrant and healthy places we like to live. And we should remember that as we think about losing our ash trees. They are, trees also provide um, a real direct benefit to human health and scientists have been studying this for a while and they're using the, the emerald ash borer um, invasion as an opportunity to discover what happens when a significant amount of trees in a community is lost. Um, because some communities have up to 40% of their um, trees are ashes. Um, so if you lose 40% of your tree canopy, what impact does that have on human health? And they've actually found that there is a relationship between um, the trees in a community and the, if you lose the trees in your community, there is a related increase in cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Um, and so there is a, a benefit to having trees in our communities for our health. There, um, tree, the result of these tests is also going to create a direct economic um, cost to us. Economists have studied the effect of non-native forest insects um, and they found that the cost of these tests are largely borne by homeowners and municipal governments. They're borne on a local level um, and they're going to have a big impact. In the United States, collectively, um, local governments and homeowners are looking to spend about um, 1.7 billion dollars in expenditures annually on these pests and that, um, there's also about 830 million dollars in lost residential property values as a result of these pests. So they're going to have an economic impact on, on the local level. Here in Vermont we've done some tree assessments and translated that into what kind of expenditure that might be. Um, so just for example, in Burlington, there's about a, hundred, a thousand ash trees in the public right away, and for the city to remove and replace them will cost around half a million dollars. Uh, in a much smaller rural town, such as Johnson, there's about um, 440 ash trees that are in the public right away along the back roads and that are likely to become hazards to that roadway. And to remove those is gonna be about $132,000. So those are real chunks of change that we're going to have to make room for in our local budgets. Um, so here in Vermont, we have about one in every 12 trees is an ash, but as I said, in our communities, they're more frequently planted because they can deal with the, the more stressful conditions of living around humans, the, um, the compacted soil, the salt, the um, getting hit by trucks. That. And so they're more often found planted in people's yards and along streets, and they grow well in disturbed areas, so they're more often found along roads. Um, just for example, we've some towns have begun doing um, surveys, and so um, Bob will might want to chime in with this. Brattleboro surve surveyed about five miles of tr um, of roads and found 300 ash trees in that public right away along the, just those five miles. Um, Bennington surveyed about 31 miles 
and found 638 trees in the right of way. And Hartford um, surveyed 104 miles and found 1,778 ash trees in the right of way. So it's a significant number of trees that we're looking at dealing with. Um, at a minimum, our towns will need to think about how to manage the liability that these trees will produce. They are um, responsible for the hazard trees that are in the right of way. And, um, so at a minimum, that is what we are looking at dealing with with this problem. Um, we might also run into problems with trees that are on private property, but that pose a public um, risk. Um, those are the issues that we're dealing with. We are encouraging all the towns to be proactive and to plan for this um, pest because by planning we can have more management options. If we are proactive, there's actually quite a few things we can do to spread out the cost to strategically save trees that we want to save or um, be, be um, strategic about how we deal with this problem. We're also encouraging towns to plan because we're going to have a lot of waste wood on our, our hands and we're going to need to do something with it. And if we plan ahead, we can be more efficient and more um, resource conscious about how we use that wood. Um, it, we might be able to um, turn it into heating options or um, some kind of artisan project, but um, if you don't plan for it, it's more likely to get wasted. Yeah. That last slide. Um Looks like they were showing somebody inoculating a tree there. Is that is there an inoculant for, for ash against the board? There ash are board? some insecticides that can be used, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. And also planning ahead will save us money. We can um, offset costs. We could coordinate with other towns and make um, a, a removal effort more efficient. Um, and and other ways to save money. And always remember that it's it's less expensive to remove a living tree than to remove a dead tree. And so maybe maybe it, in some situations it makes sense to be proactive about removing trees before they die. Why is that? Um, a tree, an ash tree becomes very um, brittle after it dies. And so it becomes a lot more hazardous to remove. And so you have to be a lot more careful and it takes longer to remove it. So it Plus a dead tree has no marketable value. Yeah, you lose your utilization. Um, so as we're talking about planning um, and management options for the Emerald Ash Borer, it's very important to understand the dynamics of a population because a lot of towns in the U.S. have gotten caught up in what we call the death curve and they think they can handle it and then all of a sudden they can't. Um, and so what this graph is showing is that the first year that an infestation is discovered, there's very little mortality. It's in the single digits, single percentage of mortality is occurring. And in fact, it stays rather low for the first six years of the infestation. You're only having single, a single percentage, less than 10% of your trees are dying. You think you can keep up with removing them, um, and perhaps you aren't taking the issue as seriously as um, we would perhaps say you should. Um, but as you can see by this death curve, at year seven, the percent mortality starts to dramatically increase. And for the next five years, 80% of your ash trees in your area will die. And in that five years, I would predict that you won't be able to keep up with the hazard trees that will be created and the problems that result from it. And so in that five years is, is the crunch time that a lot of um, the problems related to the Emerald Ash Borer become evident. And towns haven't been able to have um, the financial reserves to deal with the issue or the capacity. Um, and so understanding that the population is going to start off slow and then build to a critical level and cause massive mortality between years um, 7 and 12 is really important to um, plan ahead and um, know what's going to be coming down the road. It's also important because um, this line shows that the number of management options that are available to you rapidly decreases the longer the infestation is around. And so if you want to be strategic about how you deal with it, you really have to um, have a plan in the early years because they, they dramatically increase or decrease as the population increases. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure 
uh, what the economics are with this, but to 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 uh, convince a, a municipality that if they spend at the, at the very beginning, because it's going to cost no matter what you're going to do, whether you're going to remove trees, dead trees, or whether you're going to try and prevent mortality, right? I mean, so is it is it cheaper, if you will, over the long term then to to be more proactive, or is it a, is it you know either way you're going to spend about the same amount of money? So what's the argument for being proactive versus? removing the tree. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a great tool that I'm, I'm going to show you in a couple slides um, that allows you to compare management options so you can see a projection for, of cost. Um, so there, it, they wouldn't be the same. There's different options for managing and the cost will be dramatically different depending on which path you choose and um, there's actually a tool that's been developed that will help you predict the cost. Um, so I'll show you in a minute. Okay. Well, what are the dangers of you spreading it if you cut that tree and move it to a different section of town? Yeah. Um, once Emerald Ash Forest is here, we, there will be a, a quarantine in effect about the movement of ash wood. Um, moving it within, uh, a, within a town, within say 10 miles, is will will be okay because it um, because it's localized, <laughs> um, but um, be able to transport. Well, I was thinking like you're going to use it, utilize it for firewood or something. Yeah. You're going to move it to a different location. But. Yeah. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about quarantines and regulations and best management practices in mind. But but Molly's exactly right. Um, the 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 key concept is to keep it real local. Don't move it. Um, as soon as it's discovered, it's a federally regulated um, insect, and um, <clears throat> and federally th those federally regulated materials, which is essentially any part of the tree, uh, cannot be moved out of a quarantine zone. And I'll talk more about the quarantines and the specifics a little later. So there's a lot. There's actually a number of management that your town could choose, um, and here are just the basic ones outlined. Um, you could choose to do nothing. You could choose that, you know, um, to just let the trees die as they will, and that might make sense for the layout of your um, town. That does maybe put you in um, expose you to liability issues, but maybe you're willing to accept that, or maybe um, you know the, the layout of of your roads might make that um, a feasible option. So that is a management approach that some towns have taken. Um, you could choose to cut down every ash tree in your public right of way right away, right now, um, before they become infested, so that you mat you minimize the cost of removal because they're still alive, and you um, take away the liability issue of having dead trees in your right of way. That might make sense for your your town. Um, you will lose the important benefits that trees provide our communities, um, so that's something to consider, but um, might be a feasible management approach for you. You might decide to remove them as they become infested and die, try to keep up with, um, with, the, with the problem. It's more expensive to do that kind of reactive management than you're dealing with removing dead trees, might expose you to more liability, and there's there's the death curve. Remember that it's going to dramatically increase in the middle of your the around year seven. It's going to be a much faster mortality, and so most towns have found they aren't able to keep up with that um, demand, and so that's not that's not a, a technique that we really um, recommend that well. There's also the technique of using insecticides as a tool to manage the way that you um, need to do removals. There are insecticides that have been developed that have proven to be very effective at removing or at um, protecting a tree against emerald ash borer. Um, they can be stem injected directly into the tree 
They can be injected into the soil around the roots of the tree, or they can be sprayed onto the trunk of the tree, depending on what time of year you want to um, treat the tree, what kind of chemical you want to use, and what the, what the situation around the tree is, whether it's appropriate to um, be spreading chemicals in one way or another. Um, but they are very effective. They can save a tree from, from this insect. Um, However, they do cost money. They, it's more expensive to treat a larger tree. It's dependent on the uh, EBH of the tree. Um, so it's a cost, but it is effective. And so you can use it to save specimen trees. Maybe there's a beautiful ash tree in your town green that you want to preserve. Um, and so you can use it to save specimen trees. You can also use it to um, spread out the time that is needed to remove your trees. You can use it to prolong the death curve and allow you to um, to control the way that you want to removal instead of the insect controlling the way you have to do it. Yeah. Uh, is it a one-time treatment? <laughs> no, it, it needs to be done periodically, depending on the insecticide. Usually, it's two to three years. It needs to be repeated. Interesting. Okay. There's a question in the back. I have the same question actually. Okay. Can I put in? Yeah. Um, another, another option is some combination of these options, and that goes to your question about costs and over time. Um, I think that in some towns, they're not going to have enough ash trees in the right of way to really worry about it, and, and the little extra bump in mortality of ash trees won't be a big impact on the town's work load anyways. But in some towns, it's going to be a significant impact. And if they can recognize that now, before the insect is even here, and just begin to add a couple of trees each year to the normal maintenance of their, of their public trees, uh, you can spread the costs out over a longer period of time and, and just kind of make it a more manageable problem. Of course, in order to do that, you need to make sure that you have the ordinances that would allow you to take the trees. You may have to have a public meeting to take a public tree that isn't yet infested, but but it, it can allow you to spread that workload over a longer period of time. I'm, I'm wondering, maybe you'll address this later, but um, if, if a town doesn't have, you know, the ash trees along their public right of way, so they're not going to worry about it, they're, they're going to just, mm. how, how does, if, if the emerald ash borer is discovered in my town, mm -hmm. and my town says, I'm, I'm, we're not gonna. We can't afford to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Where does the quarantine and that concern about these things spreading then come into play, or does it? Well, the the quarantine is is implemented um, immediately, um, and and it regulates the movement of those materials. It, it it really does nothing to save the trees. It just uh, it's meant to keep the infestation from spreading, or at least by human facilitated means. Yeah, and none of these have to be a, only that option. It can be a, you can pick and choose and merge, merge options that um, are there. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the toxicity of the insecticide, like what else it kills, how safe it is? You want to talk about that? Well, I, I honestly, um, for the sake of time, don't want to get too far into it, but um, but some of them are neonicotinoids, um, which which are suspect, and and there is, I believe, legislation being developed um, that may limit their use in Vermont. Um, there is at least one that I'm aware of that's an organic. It's it's a product of the neem tree. Um, so there may still be some options in, in, available, but it just goes beyond the scope of today's meeting. Certainly, I, I've got business cards I can leave here, and I'm glad to try to share what I do know. We also do have some practitioners here that maybe during a break you can uh, get Bob or some of the others that are actually using these products. They might be able to share with you more. Yeah, and there's a really great uh, paper put out by, I think, Dan Hearns. Uh, it's a number of state universities put out a frequently asked question sheet. I'll have a link to that. Um,
Um, so this, uh, this is a graph that, that Jim will talk about in more detail, but just goes, um, illustrates the point that I was trying to make that, um, that you can use insecticides as a tool to, to prolong, to, to, um, to flatten the depth curve and to control how fast your trees are succumbing to the emerald ash borer so that you can, you can regulate the, way, the pace at which you have to remove the trees, not the bug regulating how fast you have to do it. And so if you can actually, because the insecticide is effective in the tree for multiple years, you can rotate which trees you are treating and, by the, and that way you can spread out the number of trees that are um, that are treated um, against the bug, and you can you can flatten the curve at which how fast the um, the trees are dying from the bug. And so Jim will talk about that in more detail. But just know that insecticides can be used to um, to flatten the depth curve and allow you to control how fast your trees are dying. So I'm just going to touch on this tool that I mentioned a bit earlier, and it's a um, it's a tool created by Purdue University. It's called the Emerald Asher or Cost Calculator. It can be found at, um, at this website, and it's a wonderful tool that allows you to um, compare and contrast management options, so you can get a, get an idea of long-term costs versus long-term um, results. And um, I highly encourage you checking it out. It requires you to have done a tree survey. Um, you have to input how many trees you have at what DDH. But um, changes, you know, how much it costs to treat them with insecticide versus remove them. So you have to have done a tree survey, but once you have those numbers, um, um, you, can, you can compare up to three different management approaches. So you can um, compare replacing all unsafe ash versus um, removing all ash versus saving 50% of your trees or any of the other suite of options. And then it will give you um, graphs that will compare um, compare those three options in a number of different um, considerations. So how much it will cost over time to um, you know, treat all your trees versus remove all of them and, and never, um, and not replace them. So, oh sorry, um, so you can compare this, the blue line is tr um, treating all of your trees with insecticides. So you can see you keep having to spend a lot of money um, versus cutting down all your trees and not um, not replacing them. You spend a bit of money initially, but then you don't spend any more going forward. So that that approach might look more preferable um, initially, but if you look at um, the total DBH of your of your town. Um, Tree, um, trees over time. If you cut down all the trees and don't replace them, over time you have you will have no trees in your community, um, and then you won't have any of the benefits that trees provide you. Whereas if you treat all your trees, you will be over time you will, your total tree DBH will be increasing, and you'll be getting all the benefits that trees provide you. So although it will cost more, you'll have more trees. So it allows you to to consider all the different. Um, parts of this decision. Uh, in Did, does that model discuss um, the, the marketability of the, of the timber, or are they just assuming you just tear, tear the trees down and cut them, and you have to dispose of them? I'm not sure about it's, that. it's not one of the inputs. Yeah. 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 It, it does not. So no marketable. It doesn't take that into consideration. Right. So you can you can improve your situation if you can utilize your trees. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that is a that's a brief overview of why why the monthly plan. And um, I'll take one or two questions, and then we should take a quick break and move on to the next. Part. So. so what are, it seems like this is really dealing with trees that are kind of like in the right of way, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So what are agencies or municipalities doing about, you know, like the town of Brattleboro, we have a really large watershed for, you know, our reservoir and everything. I mean, like, what are thoughts on 
like large tracts of publicly owned forest and do you just let it go because there's an existing canopy to the you know I mean yeah um I, I think there's not really necessarily one answer you know that's if I may yeah I think it's up to you know it's up to the time to decide I um I think officially we're it's, it's recommended to not go out and cut every ash tree in the world because, um, as we were talking about before, we do, there are a certain percentage of the trees are surviving with infestation, so if we can preserve those, those genes going forward, you know, who knows what the opportunities that will be able to come um, from that, from those survivors. And so we don't want to kill every ash tree tomorrow, um, but we need to manage the liability and the risks this pest creates. So if it's if it's a place that you know there, there's minimal liability, um, uh, I would it might be a feasible option to just let the tree tree die in the forest um, and not worry about removing it. But yeah, the focus of today is really about the right of way and um, where municipalities need to plan um, for managing that. Maybe this is a good time for this question, but I wonder if we will cover it. Assuming that you know this is a biodiversity, there are insects and mammals and birds and all kinds of you know other trees that are dependent on these three types of ash trees that are, are indigenous to the mud. So if they're dying, uh, if we take them out, how do we replace them with something else? Yeah, it's, it's not just that. Fuck Norton. I've replaced Chestnut Yard. Yeah, that's a big that's a big question that I won't try to answer right now, but it's, it has a, it has big ramifications um, for the loss of the species of genus. Okay, one more question. Uh, just a follow up to that to the question that, that was just asked. Do you, do you have any idea, I mean, we've had eight years basically since 2007, and I'm wondering, is there any projection forward as to when we might have research around resistance or past bio-treatments bio or, you know, that sort of thing, rather than insecticide and taking out the trees? I mean, right now, those are our, our main options. Is there any idea going forward how far along we are? In, finding other methods of control like that. Yeah, I really don't know how to put a timeline on it. Uh, you know, I can tell you that it's a very, very high priority. The U.S. Department of Agriculture spending lots and lots of money and, and a lot, a lot of time on Emerald Dashboard. Um, and, you know, you just never know when some breakthrough may come, but I, I don't know how to quantify that. We should um, take a short break, um, allow you to stretch your legs, get more food, and go to the bathroom, and we <coughs> come back at 10.20. Come back at 10.20 to move, continue on. Great, thank you. I will send out an email with with the websites and, and other resources to help lead you. I can also give you um, the PowerPoint presentations as a PDF, so that'll help you with the note taking. So um, now I will turn it over to Jim. Thank you. So are you the remote? I am the remote. Okay. I the remote to work. Oh, that's great. That's great. I see some of you already have a working understanding of quarantines. Mm -hmm. There's nobody in these front rows. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just coming off having, for last week, it's just a wicked, wicked cold. And, uh, Hang on. Just, we're going to move back here. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm staying back here. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I have a stack of my business cards. Um, I'll, I'll leave them somewhere, um, just over here. If, if you think you've got an emerald dashboard, please take one and call me. Um, 
or if you need to contact me for some other forest health issue, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, I'm going to kind of team, uh, uh, teamwork this with, with Bob here, but we wanted to take to talk about the actual the actual process of, of uh, municipal planning, and I do want to make a, a, a comment that we're really only talking about planning for Emerald Ash Borer from the point of view of municipality. We're really not talking about private landowners or, or, or woodlots and forestry scale plans. Uh, we're talking about dealing with, with public trees, really. Um, you've seen this actually already. I, I wasn't sure if anyone else would put it. But if you go to vtinvasives.org, uh, this is what you'll see. And if you click right there on tree pests, go ahead, then it takes you here, and then you can go right down here to community preparedness, and, uh, and, and then you can click on those. This prepare your community is all about planning, which Bob and I are going to cover. And then you can click here on toolbox, and they're just, just I don't know, scores and scores and scores of all kinds of resources and links to other things, including cost calculators and so on. So I wanted you to know about that. Um, okay. I wanted also to say, just uh, before we get really started, that the planning process is voluntary. I've, I've spoken to some select boards who think this is an unfunded mandate from the state. It's not at all. Um, we just want to let you know that there's a problem coming. We want you to be aware of it so you can decide is it a big problem or not. Uh, the planning uh, template or the planning worksheet that I'm going to show you is very customizable and very expandable. So you can make it suit the, the conditions of your town. Okay. Uh, the first step is to go ahead and get a core team. And, and what I'm talking about there um, is, is to find a few people uh, who are kind of passionate about all this. Um, keep it kind of small. These are the kind of people who are innovators. These are the kind of people who, you know, kind of, kind of are on the forefront of change. Um, get them together. And if they need help, give me a call. Give Molly a call. And next. Oh, next. And, and then they will work and plan, and the next step would be for that core team to get the town's blessing. Go ahead. And that's going to involve talking with the select board or town managers, whatever, and inform them, assure them, and give them some incentive. And what I'm talking about there is that, first of all, they just need to recognize that there's a problem coming. The ash trees will die. We don't know if it's going to be a problem for your town yet or not. I just finished reading uh, a, a, a plan from the town of Hyde Park. And uh, they don't have very many ash trees to worry about. So they're going to just, over the next 10 years, cut 15 ash trees each year. Problem solved. Uh, it's not a big issue for them. For other towns, Molly mentioned, some towns have a real high percentage of ash trees planted along streets. So it's going to be a big issue. We need to just let people know so that they can begin this planning process. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we're going to inform them that the problem's come and we want to assure them that this is a big problem. Uh, well, not a problem, but, and I understand this thought, but it's a, it's a common thought of select boards. How much is it going to cost? The planning process doesn't have to cost anything at all. Certainly, it can be very, very minimal. We've done it in many towns where it did not cost the town a penny. Um, it's done often with completely volunteer and technical assistance like ours. Um, so the planning process doesn't have to cost anything. And then when it comes to incentivizing, I believe that the planning process and the plan itself will, first of all, help select boards and town managers, town officials to meet their obligation for maintaining public safety. It will also meet the obligation that they have to try to be fiscally responsible. We've talked about spreading the workload out over time, maintaining options, and all that sort of thing. Um, so in many ways, uh, it, it, this is a good process to go through. OK, next. And then we get to the preliminary information. And, and what I'm talking about there is 
before you get all your troops mobilized and stuff, just do a quick assessment to see if indeed uh, you've got a big issue. <coughs> Sorry. Um, next. Um, so you want to find out how big it is. So you're going to do a tree inventory. Molly showed you some slides, and we'll see the similar slides again in, in a second here. But you want to uh, get a sense of how many ash trees do you really have, who owns them, uh, that sort of stuff. And also, in this preliminary kind of uh, stages, uh, check out, do you have a town tree ordinance? Does it give you the authority to do what you're going to need to do? Um, if not, you can begin to get working on that. And once again, we've got all kinds of uh, technical advice uh, that we can lend. Okay. Once you get that preliminary information, now you want to go ahead and get help. This is where you recruit your workforce. These people don't have to carry the entire burden. You can delegate and direct people. And once again, we can train your masses for you. Okay? Uh, I, I've been to many towns where we have a tree walk on some Saturday. We meet at the public library, and, and this group has recruited a bunch of, whether it's a Boy Scout troop or, or um, a high school class or, or the local gardening club, whatever it is, they've recruited them, and I'll take them on a tree walk and teach them how to identify ash trees, how to measure tree diameters, all that sort of stuff. Okay. So once you've got the, the you know, feet on the ground, uh, then they begin to get the information and you can actually go ahead and start planning. And, and I'm going to show you the worksheet that we've developed. And again, it's adaptable. You, you, you can make it work for the conditions in your town. Okay? And, and can you go back to the blank slide? So that's, that's in a quick, uh, you know, real quick overview of the process itself. And, and I wanted to just expose you to that and then give Bob a chance. He's actually been through this uh, to, to talk about his experiences. And, and you're going to see that it's very customizable. He, he didn't follow the exact same, you know, steps. Um, he, he did it his way. <laughs> So I'm going to just turn it over to Bob. Right, I think, uh, maybe I have this switch to the right. Uh, uh, so um, I'll just give a plug real quick about uh, Forest Pest First Detectors two and a half years ago. Uh, I became a volunteer with them and went to a one day training. And it was a really great experience. You know, it can be broadly applicable uh, to people who are serving a number of different roles. Um, uh, and um, I guess I'm a little curious, like, how many people are, like, taking care of roads? Are people looking after roads? And then, like, looking after, like, woodlots? A lot of people do that. And then, like, people's clients' trees kind of thing? Some folks here? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so, Forest Pest First Detectors, uh, there's a lot of tools that that that, that training gives you. Um, uh, one of the first things I did uh, with my little you know emerald ash borer sample was to go and talk to the local tree board in Brattleboro, uh, and I guess you can go on to the next uh, slide there. And they happen to be a really passionate, dedicated group of tree lovers, and there was an opening, so I joined, and that uh, that turned out to be a really great thing because when I went to the select board, when I approached the select board about presenting a town for the plan, the first thing I said was, well, I'll talk to the tree board. And so that was easy. Uh, let's see. So um, we, uh, we wanted to get a plan together. We quickly realized that we didn't really know the scope of the problem in Brattleboro. So we wanted to find out how many trees, how many ash trees were within the right of way, right? Uh, and the tree board had done a uh, tree survey like 20 years ago, and you know I had to go to the planning department and go to this special room and pull this thing out and look at it, and it was fairly incomprehensible, really, <laughs> to look at. It was difficult to find out where an ash tree was using that. So uh, going forward, I knew that it would be important to have something that was more accessible than that and, and easier. It had, it had taken a toll on the tree board putting that survey together because it was a lot of legwork and paperwork. 
uh, I guess we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to, uh, we weren't going to drive all the miles of road in Brattleboro. That wasn't going to happen. It's 106 miles or something like that. Uh, but um, one of the online tools that the Forest Service puts out is called iTree. And uh, they have survey tools associated with that, but that wasn't really working for us. It, it was dependent on uh, like Windows phones, like a kind of a, uh, uh, anyway. So, uh, uh, but they do have some valuable resources on the iTree uh, website, one of which was a way to generate random segments of roads. And uh, this gets into, uh, you use our, GIS and, and I was in over my head, but I found somebody in the planning department who could help out with that. Uh, and he, uh, and with an intern, took all the, the total miles of roads in Brattleboro and then sampled 6% of them in, in sort of randomly, evenly spaced out segments throughout town. Uh, and I guess you can go to the next slide. And uh, so that's what this looks like. I don't know if you can see the little red sections. Those are the roads that came up on this sampling, and 6% and is what the uh, iTree recommends for a town our size. So we were kind of getting a somewhat randomized sampling. That's what we were going for anyway. But a lot of smaller towns, I don't think you'd need to do this. You could, you could say, okay, we've got, you know, I don't know, 20 miles of roads, and let's just take five of them and, and go for a drive. And, and what this, uh, how this, sampling took place was, uh, a lot of this was um, done by John Ogrzalik, who is a uh, graduate student at Antioch University. <coughs> so uh, uh, basically the ideal method is two people go for a drive and, and uh, one of them, you, you look out the windshield and look for ash trees and, and you can try and just sort of uh, Break them into size categories, and size categories is another thing that's available on the iTree website. It's sort of the standardized size categories. So I think it's 0 to 3, 3 to 6 inch diameter breast height, 6 to 12, 12 to 18. You kind of get the picture. But if you can just drive slowly down a back road and uh, check off every time you see a, a 2 foot ash, and every time you see a 2 and a half foot ash, uh, you can. Uh, you can figure out how big the problem is going to be for your town, how many ash trees and how big they are. Uh, so we only did 6%. Um, and I guess we can go to the next slide. And then we extrapolated that. We multiplied our findings on those segments of road by 16 uh, to get the 100%, you know, extrapolated it. Brattleboro is broken down into three <coughs> neighborhoods. There's the urban neighborhood, residential neighborhoods, and rural neighborhoods. So we looked at that separately, um, and there were three, 3,500 trees along our rural roads and uh, 350 along our residential roads. So here we have something we can start to deal with. We can go to the select board and, and talk to them with some kind of uh, general idea of the scope of the problem, right? Um, so the next step was to figure out where exactly, ideally we'd like to know exactly where all those ash trees are, right? That's a lot of work, uh, which we haven't done, um, but we wanted to get started on it, at least in the urban center. So we had gotten a, um, there's uh, micro grants from the state of Vermont uh, that uh, you can ask those guys about. Uh, they're pretty easy to get. You fill out a page and, um, well, <laughs> it was easy for me to get. Hannah O'Connell put a lot of light of work into it. Uh, but, uh, um, one of the things we did with that grant was we bought a, uh, a Nexus tablet, a $200 tablet. Doesn't have to have a data, anything associated with it. It's Wi-Fi. Uh, and what we did that because I was looking around for a tool that we could do a survey that would make it accessible, uh, more accessible than the back room of the planning department. And I also wanted it to be free. Uh, and uh, I wanted it to, um, not be reliant on a network connection while you were trying to take the data because they don't exist in a lot of places in Brattleboro. So, uh, so that's the solution that fit best was to, to get this Nexus tablet. You can also you'll also use any kind of Android phone. And then I guess we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so this is what we're going for in the next slide. 
is there's this thing called Open Data Kit, which is uh, developed by the University of Washington with funding from Google. And it works great on Google devices like Android devices. Uh, and it's, uh, it was developed as a survey tool, particularly for like third world regions where they need to get medical data um, and they're off the grid. But you can uh, assemble basically a survey with it. And um, what it looks like is, uh, I'm going to open it up on my phone. You can fill in a blank form. That's the form I'm going to fill in, Brad Trees. And then you can record your location at the tap of a button, and then that accesses the GPS. Again, you don't need a data connection for this. You don't, I don't, there's no monthly fee attached to it. And then it, uh, it gets a location, and that's the first question I've answered. And then you go through the next one, and then uh, you can enter the address, you can enter what tree species you're standing in front of, and the size, and the condition, all the sort of standard tree survey questions. You can take a picture of it, and then save that. And it just saves it on the phone and the tablet. And then you go on to the next tree, right? Uh, and then when you get back into a Wi-Fi zone, it uh, uploads all that onto an app server. And then you can access that data. And that's what yields, if you want to go back a slide, that's what yields a map like this. When you're looking at that in a web browser, you can, uh, all these are locations of ash trees. And you can tap on, click on one of those arrows. And it'll bring up the picture you took and all the data that you recorded. Um, it's, it's not a perfect system. I did this, what, a year ago? There's probably something better out there by now. But, uh, but that was the idea. We wanted to find out where these trees were. Um, <clears throat> because when it comes time to either remove or protect them, that, we're going to have to know, right? Particularly downtown. And, and uh, I'd like in the next year to know where all the residential trees in Brattleboro are. Um, Okay, so let's move on. So, uh, so then getting ready to, to take something to the select board, we, we used uh, the EAB cost calculator uh, that Molly was talking about. And we looked at just taking out all the trees proactively, reactively, and then treating 30% of them as uh, just to compare on a graph. And I guess we can go to the next slide. This is the graph we got. Uh, I want to take a minute to uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit about this. Uh, Cliff Sadoff, who came up with this tool, Emerald Dashboard Calculator, talked in Boston about a month ago. There's some new research uh, coming out about uh, the, this line, the blue line, the treatment line, how expensive it is to treat over time, is uh, angling downward. Uh, more and more, they're realizing that you can get longer protection from smaller doses of one of the treatments, Emmectin benzoate, it's one of the four uh, treatments than was previously thought. Um, if you're bidding large numbers of trees, like over 200 trees, uh, so large municipalities or smaller municipalities that get together on a bid, the costs go down. Uh, I think in a lot of the material, uh, there's a range, but in the Midwest, towns are paying below that range. Uh, we're talking about, like, so in some cases, under $5 per diameter inch uh, every other year. So I don't want to get lost in the weeds too much, but this, this line is sort of coming down um, for those two reasons. And also, it's becoming uh, sort of better understood scientifically that the tail end, this is going to not continue to keep rising, that once the populations of bugs uh, crashes, that you'll be able to monitor your ash trees that are still alive. Uh, and maybe treat them once every four years, or maybe treat them when they look stretched, or you detect a bug in a trap. So um, so anyway, so, then, uh, so we took this information to the select board, and I guess we can go on. Uh, oh, this, was, this made a big impression on the select board, because we talked about the costs, and, and this is the, uh, the, the amount of canopy, the, the total diameter of trees. And the blue line, the treatment line, just keeps on growing. You know, that's, tree, tree people tend to, tend to like that, right? And we'll go ahead to the next slide. So we presented to the select board. There's Jim and Hannah. Thanks for helping out. And uh, 
Brattleboro, you know, I don't know if you're aware, is a cash-strapped town. There's some huge budget fights going on in town. But, um, but people love trees, and they were really receptive to saving trees, but also to saving money. And I guess that's the big, you know, takeaways. Right now, we're still in, in a period in history when we can consider our options uh, in a sort of an abstract sense, and I can carefully consider them. What people have found where the bugs are discovered is that it gets really noisy, that there's a lot of shouting. Um, so uh, this is a great opportunity to kind of get our heads together uh, in terms of how we're gonna take care of our, our street trees. And I guess we can go to the next slide. There's a lot of work to do with Brattleboro, but there's a mechanism to save these trees now, and, and I think that's great. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine that parking lot without some big trees in it. So uh, is there any questions? Oh, I guess we should go to the next slide. Oh, so one of the uh, <coughs> parts of the plan is doing public outreach. So uh, Bob DeServo and I did an event and it got picked up by the paper. Every year there's a big uh, parade through Brattleboro. All these folks coming in from out of town. It seemed like the right place to have a message about not moving firewood, so that's me dressed up as a bug with an umbrella that says, don't move firewood. That's an annual event, so if you want to help, if you want to march in the Australian uh, Heifers Parade, let me know. Is it, uh, all right, sweet. Yes. I would also plug it. We have, we have a, like I would call it a Woodlands Pavilion, too, so um, great. it's a great opportunity to learn some more about this and other relevant issues, too, or, or to showcase something yourself. Yeah, yeah awesome. Now, you, you talk about the forest pest first Responders or another no, no, I'm just saying that the strolling of the heifers, the, the uh, what do they call it? The thing that happens after the parade, you know, there's a there's a Woodlands Pavilion that has, you know, Jim, Jim has exhibited there with Forest and Parks and other folks. And it's just anything sort of forest related. Right. Um, right. So, it, anyway, that's right. But so if you're, you know, if you're in... Grafton, you probably know where folks are coming in from out of town with fire and water. You might know where to put that poster, so uh, there's opportunities for that. And I guess we can go to the next slide. Um, here's some online resources that I, you'll get emailed to you that I've talked a bit about. Uh, Emerlashboard.info. I guess I'd highlight that they have uh, on-demand webinars on that website. A couple of, there's like three on uh, managing woodlots. There's uh, there's a wide variety of topics of webinars uh, there, so that's really great. Tree benefits calculator, what trees are, uh, what managing trees is gonna cost, and there's the, uh, the sampling thing I mentioned, open data kits. This is the tree computer, which can uh, explain how much a tree, a living tree is worth in terms of storm water mitigation and uh, cooling costs, all that. The uh, Brattleboro Preparedness Plan is uh, at my website. And then uh, this is, uh, I think I referred to it earlier, there's a fact sheet that was put out by a number of different research universities about, um, about insecticides and frequently asked questions about them. I guess I mentioned really quickly when I was talking to the select board, it definitely got their interest that there's an OMRI rated you know, organic treatment for ash trees. So um, there's a number of options. And, and that's one of them. That, that definitely was uh, interesting to the Brattleboro Select Board. Any questions? All right, then. Oh, cool. I don't even know which way to hold it. This is the part I really like. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. Perfect, perfect. So, so up till now we've been talking about why plan and, and about the planning process and, and then we heard a, a real case study of planning. And, and those, um, well, let me first explain. This is the, if you go to vtinvasives.org and, and click on that tab for tree pests and then down below there was a toolbox of preparing your community to plan. If you check on that, preparing your community, um, it'll bring you, or you'll, you'll still have to do a little bit of navigating, but it'll bring you to the actual planning worksheet. And this is the first page of it. It's set up to be a checklist so that you can kind of 
kind of keep track of who's responsible for what and, and create a timeline and, um, and kind of keep the, the whole process on track. And, and if you notice, um, we, we've covered, overshooting, we've covered the first uh, four or five here, uh, identifying stakeholders, convening an informational meeting, making a team, getting your town information, um, and then uh, assessing your resources and defining your purpose. Those are all uh, kind of the planning things. Now we're going to get into actual implementation. We actually, th these are verbs, you know, you identify, you monitor, you plan, you determine. Um, so now we're going to get into the, the, the real implementation. And again, I, I look to Bob with his, uh, you know, practical experiences and Molly chip in as well. Um, Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Come on. Let's see. There we go. There we go. Um, and, and I just stuck this in um, just to give credit to Mark Whitmore. Um, he is uh, with the Extension uh, Service in New York State where they already have ML Dash 4. And so I, I put this in just to credit him. Several of his slides are, are blended into mine. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, since we don't have Emerald Ash 4 here yet, um, I wanted to just learn some of the concepts involved f from the situation that they do have in New York State. And this shows you where the infestations are. Um, I was detailed to work here in this infestation a couple of years ago. Uh, for a week, I was down there with them working, um, and so I was able to learn a little bit. And since then, I've heard Mark speak several times, and and so I, this is a sense of uh, where the infestations are. And this gray shaded area is the area that's quarantined. This is uh, I just stuck this in here to give you a, a, a sense of how they how they manage. They manage according to zones, and I'm sorry, it's a little small. Oh, sorry, so are these buttons. Um, you can see here the black areas are, are the core areas, and then there's a ring around that's kind of reddish. That's one or zero to five miles from the core, and they consider those areas severe risk. And then there's an orange zone that's five to ten miles away that's considered high risk. And then they consider just the rest of the state significant risk. And, and their management um, uh, activities depend on how far away they are from the actual infestation. And, and that's a concept that we espouse here. Of course, we don't have an infestation yet, so we haven't actually implemented. But we would say if, if you're in that uh, severe risk, zero to five miles for sure, uh, begin to think about uh, management. But we would say, 10 to 15 miles from an actual known infestation is where you want to really uh, start implementing. Which isn't to say that some things couldn't be done before discovery, and, and we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, this is one of uh, Mark's slides, and, and you see that the core area is only 1.7% of the state, and the actual infested area is still less than 2% of the state. And they've had it for four and a half years. So, so my point here uh, with this slide is, is that, you know, we don't want to panic. And also uh, recognize that it could be infested here. That's certainly within that giant grayed out uh, quarantined area. But see how much of the quarantined area is not yet infested. And so there were a couple of very good insights to some questions earlier about um, what do you do when you cut a tree down on the side of the road and stuff. Um, what we want to do is not artificially expand these infested, infested areas. You know, we want to try to keep this shaded gray area as clear of, of emerald ash borer as we can for as long as we can. Um, and that's where the don't move firewood idea comes in that several people have mentioned already. And, and uh, in a later slide, I'll try to mention some other best management practices but those are a couple of concepts that we're learning from the situation in New York. Um, slowing the spread is, is really our, our key uh, strategy right now. Um, oh, I guess I'm going to mention 
best management practices now. <laughs> I thought of this later. Um, the best management practices, those have to do with um, not moving stuff far from where it's cut. Try to, try to keep things as local as possible. Um, if, if you have to move stuff within the quarantine, it's legal. But uh, again, to cut down on human facilitated transport, uh, you want to try to chip it if you can. Um, you want to try to let it dry if you can. Um, move it during periods when the insect isn't flying, essentially in the winter. And, and, and then use it before the bug would start flying in the spring and summer. Those are, those are kind of basic concepts for BMPs. Um, I'll get into quarantines a little bit later. Um, but by slowing the spread, we give the biocontrols, those parasitoids that are already approved and being used, we give them time to try to build their populations up. Um, they're very expensive. Uh, you, you only buy them in lots of like a couple hundred at a time. They're almost, you, you can hardly see them. They're just like a little teeny dot. And for them to spread out over, you know, several hundred acres and, and really have an impact on emerald ash borer, it just takes time. They gotta find each other, they gotta mate, they gotta lay eggs, you know, all that. <laughs> We're not going into that. <laughs> I get too embarrassed. Uh, but it just it just takes time. And it's expensive, and so if we can slow the spread and keep the, ins the, the EAB where it is, it gives those, those other insects, the parasitoids, they're all wasps, it gives them time to, for their populations to get established. It also gives time for other research. You know, I mentioned the new developments in traps. You know, if, if we can keep the bugs where they are and let the researchers keep making their progress, we might find some other really uh, important uh, developments come along. And, and, and especially, just not to panic and over, overreact. So, um, again, some, some concepts here. Um, there's, the population behavior is based on two basic uh, uh, concepts. One is pest pressure. Essentially, that means how many bugs there are in any one place. And then host tree density, which is how many ash trees, how much food there is in any one place. And, and the combination of these two, are, or the interaction of these two, is going to determine how quickly trees are going to die in any one place and how quickly the infestation is going to spread. If, if there's a lot of bugs, they can kill any individual tree more quickly than if there are only a few bugs. If there are a lot of bugs in a lot of trees, they get disseminated and, and it slows down. If there's a lot of bugs and only a few trees, they're going to eat themselves out of house and home and move on quickly. So, so there's these interactions amongst those variables. Do they have a preference over the age of the tree that they go for young sapling? I'm not, I'm not aware of a, of a preference. I, I know that trees as small as an inch or so in diameter have been attacked. I don't know if it was preferential. Um, Okay, so that's why monitoring is so important. The use of those purple traps, the new, the new generation traps, the Cerceris wasps that you had mentioned. We also do trap trees, and I see folks in the audience who have helped us to girdle ash trees um, early in the spring before the bugs are, are in flight. Uh, in order to pre-stress a tree, the assumption is that if there's an adult in the area, um, they're more likely to go to easy pickings, a stressed tree, and lay their eggs on that stressed tree. And then before those, the, the larvae that come from those eggs are able to mature and leave that tree, we'll come and cut the tree down, peel the bark off, look for the, the larva. And so that's another method of detection. So um, we're monitoring in several ways, and, and, and it gives us a sense of how many insects, we already know the density of the host trees, so monitoring is real critical in helping us uh, to manage wisely. And again, I apologize that this is awful slow, or small. Uh, I guess I'm the slow one. Um, but anyways, if you look, here's the, this is the county of Windsor, this red line. These are privately owned trees, privately owned ash trees. Here's Rutland County, the second line. The third line is Wyndham County. And the next line is Bennington County. 
So the four southern counties of, of Vermont have a large portion of the ash trees in our state. And, and so you, you think back to, to this, okay? I saw him. Yeah. Does uh, ash yellows, does that monitor, or is that similar to tree girdling? If a tree, is, if you have an outbreak of, I mean, we have a lot of ash yellows, trees yeah. dying from that. Does that mimic uh, girdling an ash tree? In terms of? Attracting the, the adults. Attracting the adults. Yeah. Um, I've never read or heard specifically that, that they're similar in the way they attract, but, yeah. but in the sense that they are stressing the trees, and I, in general, I would think that yes. Specifically, I'm, I can't say for certain. So, monitoring is important, and, and we've already seen from Bob's uh, talk and, and what Molly had said earlier that tree inventory is also important. Just so you know whether or not this is something that, that is going to be a huge headache for your town or not. Um, so, so, let me share with you, just uh, this is the first page of a section from the VT Invasives. If you go there um, and check on, check on tree pests and then check on community planning, um, and then uh, go to the toolbox. Uh, this is the first page. It's a it's five page document of instructions to how to do tree inventories. And we've done this in many towns, almost exclusively with with volunteers. In some instances, there have been some paid uh, interns. Um, and you've heard how uh, these guys did it with with uh, you know high tech kind of electronics. Um, this is my laptop and this is my printer, and um, I, I just I just sit in the back seat while somebody drives slowly down the road, and I just check. There's one. There's one. There's one. You know, there's there's different ways to skin this cat, but the the trick is we need to figure out how many trees we've got. Here's here's uh there there a multitude of ways to do this. You mentioned eye tree. Uh, this is one that our department put together. It's a rapid assessment. All it does is lump trees into large-sized <coughs> categories, and then also determine whether they're in the right-of-way owned by the town, out of the right-of-way owned by private uh, individuals, or within the utility right-of-way. So we're just getting numbers, size, and who owns trees. That's kind of the foundational kind of information. Yeah. Um, has, have the utilities been partaking in any of this training or awareness or any preventative activities? Or, yep. And I had V-Trans as well. Yeah, yeah I, I can tell you that, that others, I, I myself have, have spoken at low level to local crews, <clears throat> but I, I know that some of our uh, uh, superiors have spoken at a higher level in state agencies. So yeah. That, did you need a more specific? Yeah, we, we see them as stakeholders and we have definitely reached out to them. Yeah. The utilities and transportation people both. It just seems like the municipalities are being, my perception is the municipalities are being really active about planning for this, but it seems like there's a lot of other, you know, groups and agencies that own, have substantial interest in this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me let me get in, in a few more slides. Uh, I'll get to that as well. Some of the other agencies and other stakeholders. That's a good observation. Thank you. So, so this is a very simple uh, uh, way to, to collect the basic data. And then there's a kind of a second level of intensity. And this again is described at vtinvasives.org. Um, and, and this gives us a little more information about specific trees that pose some sort of a hazard. It's all explained in there. Molly, myself, um, others uh, that work in our department can come and assist you. We can do a training uh, day for this. It wouldn't even take a day, but we could do a training session to help you get a crew that could determine uh, how many trees that you're talking about. That'll give you a, a, the beginning of a sense of how big of a problem do we have? You've seen this slide already, the different management options. We've spoken about how you can do a combination of them. Um, 
the, the, the idea of either being proactive or reactive is, is compared in this little matrix here. You can see there are pros and cons of either approach. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, I won't get into all of the nitty gritty, but um, it, it's, it's also included in here. We can discuss this later if, if your wheels are turning and, and you're kind of wondering about, should I get started now or just wait till they all die? <laughs> and, and honestly, part of the answer to that question is going to be, are you like Hyde Park and you've only got 150 trees to worry about? Or are you like Winooski and, and towns like that that have got a lot of trees right on the street side? We've, we've spoken of insecticides. I really didn't want to get in. I understand the, the concerns. Um, I, just because of time and the nature of this meeting, I didn't want to get into the technical aspects, but here are some common uh, uh, products that are used, and, and I just wanted to say that it's a tool in the toolbox. I tell you, one of the things that your town's going to have to do, and you can do this before the discovery of EAB, is to decide whether your town's okay with using them at all. Some towns are not. And so, you know, you can have that discussion before the insect is here and, and then be ready when the time to act does come. Um, and one other quick comment I'll make is that these are all systemics so that they're introduced directly into the tree, uh, which, which um, helps to regulate some of the, the concerns. You don't have you don't have drift and, and you don't have some of those problems that might be associated with other application techniques. And, and that contributes to the level of uh, safety that you might have. And efficacy from the young guessing too, right? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know why I even threw this in, uh, but just as a general rule of thumb, most of the products, um, if a tree's got more than 30% decline in its canopy, uh, they're probably too far gone for most of the products to save. So the rule of thumb um, is trees like that don't bother spending money on chemicals. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just got to get caught up with my own notes here. Someone mentioned utilities. Um, you know, utilities want to protect their lines. They want to protect their lines from dead trees falling. They also want to protect their lines from you all, or me, or, you know, Joe Homeowner. Um, so in many cases, uh, it, it pays to dialogue with utilities uh, and figure out who's going to do what. And, and our experience really has gone across the spectrum on this one. There are some, some towns, some town tree wardens who get along great with the utility or the contractor the utility uses to maintain the lines in that particular town. And they've, all, they've got it figured out already. And there are other towns where there's no communication at all. So it really runs the gamut. Um, but it would pay for you before it actually happens to figure out, you know, talk to your utility provider or the contractors that they use and just figure out um, who's going to cut these trees because they want to protect their, their lines. But we have heard, and, <laughs> and I've heard it in my own business as well, that uh, sometimes they'll tell you it's cheaper for us to fix them than to protect them and they'll just let the trees fall and then put the wires <coughs> back together. Um, so then you have to enter into a discussion about public safety. So many of the lines are along the edge of the right of way. Um, and, and so then you've got to look to your ordinance. Can you kind of have the authority to make them deal with stuff? Um, it doesn't always have to come to a, you know, applying force, but sometimes it might. And I tell you, I've seen some very interesting things. When I was detailed to work over New York State, I saw places where in order to cut the costs and, and to be able to work more quickly, uh, utility companies were, were uh, hired to just cut the, the, the tops of the trees off. And then they left, you know, anything that was below the level of the power line, they just left it there. Then later, at their convenience, the town road crew or, or, or uh, some of them were park and rec kind of people could come through and cut those down. 
And, and so the, the, the dangerous, the technical stuff, the utilities did, and they just went real quick. And he could drive along the side of the road, and all the trees just ended, right, the power line. And then later on, at a time more convenient to public works or whoever it was, they, they did the rest. So, so dialogue, and, and you can figure that out. Um, this, is, uh, this is just a quick uh, estimate, and again, it's New York data. But you can see that they, they had to do some basic inventory work, but they were able to come up with a cost. And uh, so you can see here, they figured out how many miles of, of vulnerable transmission line they had. And you can see here that they figured out by, by doing whether it was with a, a phone or a, a tab, uh, this is my tablet, um, somehow they figured out how many trees per mile times number of miles, they came up with a total number of trees. And then they, they made an estimate of 20% of them were ash trees, so they were looking at 5 million ash trees. And then based on an a assumption of $300 per tree, they came up with a cost. And I think this is uh, over a large portion of the whole state of New York. I don't know how much, how much uh, uh, ground this utility company covers, but, but that's, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, our towns, the numbers aren't going to be so big, but it's an example of how you utilize the numbers. And the numbers, the each individual number is not hard to get. That's, I guess that's the point I wanted to make here. Um, okay, Molly mentioned SLAM, which stands for Slowing Ash Mortality. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and this is a system, uh, I, I should point out before we get going on this, that um, it's, it's, a, it's a, I guess you could call it a system, it's a concept um, that's been worked out with computer modeling. They're beginning to actually implement this on the ground yet, but it's only started recently. They don't have this many years of experience and observations. So, so these are, these are computer-generated lines simulating uh, the, the results. Um, but the idea is, is capitalizing on the fact that some of these systemic insecticides, first of all, are very effective, and second of all, have two to three years' worth of residual effect. The idea is that you don't necessarily have to treat all the trees in the same year. So you can spread out the cost again and, and uh, get different results. Now, you know, if you, if you get started in the planning process and you decide that your town doesn't really uh, need ash trees, you can go to that do nothing option. But if you decide that you want to protect some of your ash trees, then there are different ways to accomplish that. By cutting, by treating, by some combination of reactive, proactive, different combinations. Yeah. That light gray line that we see sloping, it says 10%. Is that 10% of the ash trees are treated? Yeah, I'm going to so, show you that. Okay. I'm going to show you that right here. But anyways, um, mm -hmm. slow ash mortality capitalizes on the fact that there are some <clears throat> effective chemical treatments that will protect trees and that they have two to three years worth of uh, protective uh, capability. And so here's the idea. Um, actually, these slides, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. These slides don't match up perfectly with these lines. But, but you get the idea. You get the idea. Oop, wrong line. Here's, here's in, a, in a scenario where we treat 20% of the trees each year for five years. In year zero, these are the trees. None of them are treated. Next year, we treat 20% of the trees, so they're happy. They're protected. These other trees are exposed, it's not so happy. Next year we treat another 20%, but these are still protected, you know, because the, the, the residual effects. Third year we treat some more. Then notice those yellow faces went away. After three years, these aren't protected anymore. And then in the fifth year. So you end up protecting a certain component of the entire population of trees. And, and that's why you get some drop-off, but you do save a lot of them. 
and you spread the cost out over time. Now, here's the 33% solution. <laughs> this is Mark Whitmore's slide. I, I, I've got to give him credit for that. I don't, I don't know how to get Yoda onto PowerPoint. Um, but with the 33% solution, uh, there's a particular amamectin benzoate that, that um, Bob mentioned is good for at least three years residual protection. So you treat a third of the trees year one, the other third in year two, the next in year three, now you've got them all covered. They're all protected. And, and theoretically, you know, they can all survive. Now some of them are going to die from other causes anyways. You know, you, that's just a natural part of it. Um, and, and so, so all these combinations and permutations of treatments can get complicated, and figuring out how much they cost can get complicated. And now you've seen everybody introduce. Uh, there's that. There's that um, web address. Or if you just if you just Google EAB cost calculator, um, you, you'll you'll come to this cost calculator. So again, it's been shown. I won't dwell here, but you need to know the number of trees and their size. And, and you need you can then experiment with different options. I threw these last couple of slides in again. Um, this uh, Tom Story uh, did a presentation on the same day that Mark Whitmore did for road crews over in Bennington County back last May, and um, I was able to get their slideshows, so I I pirated some of the slides. Um, and, and I only took two from Tom's, but I thought these would be very interesting to you all. Uh, these are just his, his notes. I just copied this slide verbatim. But I'll give you a minute if, if your glasses are good enough. Um, but it was discovered in, in Ulster County, New York in 2010. It was spreading uh, somewhere around five miles per year. Uh, they concluded that all of their ash trees would die. Um, they thought it would go from 20% of the trees infested to 100% in about four years. Now this is after discovery. Remember the way the death curve went? Early on, the number of trees dying is, is pretty small. The trick with that death curve is that when the mortality numbers are real small, generally it's not even been discovered yet. Usually EAP isn't discovered until you're on that real steep rising part of the death curve. And once that happens, you don't have much time before they're all gone. And, and that's really what this observation is saying right here. So that means if you're going to be proactive, you've got to do it before. I mean, if you're, if you're going to do anything, you've got to do it before it's found. Otherwise. Well, well, I mean, before it's found would be the idea. But, but the real point is that the better monitoring we, that we do, the earlier we can detect it, the better off. Yeah, that's the, exactly the right insight. So anyways, what I really, really wanted to draw your attention to was um, right here. This is Tom's story. More trees will die and will become a potential liability than we have ever experienced prior to EAB. More, tr more issues with trees will have a drain on already limited resources. So this is a, a person, in, you know, he's an agency of transportation worker where it's already happening, and, and this is the impact on him. Um, and, and so one of my primary messages today is to just to encourage you to be thinking ahead, deciding whether you could take some time and some effort, find some volunteers who might do it for you, to just do that preliminary inventory to just get a sense of should we worry a lot about this, or only a little. Before it comes, in addition to doing that tree inventory, you know, you could be doing an inventory. Do we have the personnel? Do the personnel have the training? Do we have enough chainsaws? Do we have a bucket truck? Do we need a bucket truck? Um, would we hire that out? Would we not? Would our town use chemical insecticides or not? If so, would we do that? Do we have someone who's a certified applicator that works for the town? Would we have to hire it out? All those kind of things can be figured out beforehand. There's a hand? Yeah? When you talk about are we going to do anything, you mentioned a few minutes ago ordinance. 
by what authority can you do something and does that include just the right of way or does that include the utility right of way or does that include private landowner trees that are leaning into the right of way so are you going to address that at some point I really wasn't going to go deep into tree law and, and tree warden. Um, uh, the role of the tree warden, but um, but we could do that. We could pro provide materials. Um, we could do another session. Um, but it, in general, uh, tree wardens have the right to cause to be removed a tree in the public way that is infested or presents some kind of a public hazard. What you might do if your ordinances don't allow already is to create an ordinance that would give you the, the uh, authority to cause an infested or hazardous tree on private land that presents a hazard to the public to be removed. I actually just saw this implemented just the other day in Springfield. Um, not because of EAB, but a, a large tree on the top of a bank uh, got a big crack in it in the winter storm the other day, and uh, they actually had to chain it up so it wouldn't split uh, while well, they got somebody to come and take care of it. And in the meantime, the town had to divert traffic around so it wouldn't, you know, so traffic wouldn't be in the way. And, and eventually they were able to get a, a contractor with a bucket truck and a crane and a big crew. And they had a traffic control crew and some policemen. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I'm sure it was pretty expensive. And because the tree was out of the public right of way, um, it had to be paid for by the individual that owned the tree. But it had to be done for the public good, the public safety. And, and my thought is that if towns can get together and begin to think through some of these possible scenarios and their ramifications, that we might be able to help the citizens in our towns to um, at least mitigate the impacts that Emerald Ash Borer is going to have on them. Um, we might be able to, for instance, uh, determine that, you know, our road crew uh, isn't going to be able to deal with all the trees that get into that 10-foot zone around wires, that utility right of way. Um, so we're going we're gonna to let the utilities deal with that. But there are other trees that maybe are too complicated in the public spaces that we're going to contract uh, an arborist uh, to, do, to do those. And, and we, we figure out that there's 10 such trees in our public land. Well, you can make a contract with a, a private arborist to deal with those 10 trees. Or you could make a contract to say, you know, we got 10 on public land, but I bet you there's 500 in town on people's backyards and stuff. And, and, and make a bigger group contract and allow the public citizen to enter into that so that when you have the public trees dealt with, they can get that same kind of price break, you know, from a bigger contract. Maybe you could work something like that out for removals, for treatments. You know, there's a lot of ways that towns could help their citizens out if you think and plan ahead of them. We've got a, a gravel road that follows a stream bank, as many towns here do. And on one side, you've got a very steep bank. On the other side, you've got a relatively level for about 50 feet, which includes the utility lines. And then you've got another steep bank, and there are some uh, 20, 25, maybe even 30 inch DBH ash trees leaning over towards the road and utility lines, but they're on private landowner property. So when they die, they're taking the lines down, they're going to be in the road. Mm -hmm. And the landowners are saying, when it happens. Mm -hmm. Well, but at a cost of thousands of dollars, you know, often <clears throat> for a single tree, who can blame them? I mean, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the cost of ownership. It is, if it's on their land, it's their responsibility. But maybe there's a way. You, you were telling me that in Jamaica, sometimes towns and individuals can split the difference. You know, um, you just need to think through that and make sure that you have the legal authorization to make those kind of deals. 
and, and do it ahead of time. Just one more comment on this. The Wyndham Regional Commission is, is organizing a shared services between municipalities. And this may be an opportunity. Um, right now, we're, we're really asking the municipalities for what support they want in, in terms of shared services that would really help. So whether it's floodplain management or whatever. But this emerald ash borer could be a really good opportunity um, to create larger contracts, to um, get people um, who can apply these pesticides um, to, trained to move between different towns in, in order to coordinate some of the, the town activities. So if you have an interest in this, feel free to send me an email and, and I, can, I can start facilitating the conversation. That's wonderful, Kim. I'm, I'm glad you said that. But that's the kind of cooperation and interaction that if we are forewarned, we can work on it and we can be prepared better. I mean, there's no good solution to this, um, but we can be better prepared when it comes. If, I was just going to say, if, uh, I think if I were doing the, the windshield survey again, I would have a category, you know, where you check it if the tree was going to wipe out a power line. So that would identify the trees where the, where the power company had a stake and sort of, you know, separate those from where they didn't, just as a you know, way to go forward with the discussions. And that is built into, um, right here, this, this very basic rapid assessment. You ch ashes that are in the town right-of-way, ashes that are on private ground, ashes that would affect the utility right-of-way. So that's built in. Cool. Uh, let, me, let me just finish up my slides here um, and then allow more time for conversation and discussions. Um, Yeah, here we go. This is the last of Tom Story's slides. Uh, this is just a spreadsheet of the two work projects. Um, again, I know most of you can't read this, but it's done by two different, uh, this is Hughes Tree Experts, and this is Limber Tree. Um, and it just, it just quantifies the number of trees they cut and everything. Um, but what you can't read is right here. This is average cost for Hughes Tree Experts. They, uh, they cut a total of 308 trees, a total of 2,591 inches, and, and the total cost $227 per tree. So this is, you know, real life, real figures. This other, this other work project was done by a different company, and their average cost per tree was $305 per tree. Just just to give you a sense of what people are really experiencing. Do we know if that included, say, chipping, or if it was just laying them on the ground? From this data, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, you know, people are wondering what's going to really happen. And and when it, when it actually is found, um, I can stop and grafting on my way home. <laughs> um, um, first of all, the, the municipalities will be notified. We will get placed into action to delimit the, the actual infestation, to actually be able to you know, try to put a boundary around it. And an emergency quarantine will be set in place almost immediately. Um, the quarantine, and actually all of this work, is going to be um, overseen by uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture the APHIS, which stands for Animal Plant Health and Inspection Service. Um, but there will be a real coordinated effort uh, involving many, many organizations. Um, Molly's with Extension, I'm with Forest and Parks. Um, our Vermont Agency of Agriculture will be highly involved, especially with the regulatory part, the, the quarantine part. Uh, APHIS kind of is the overarching uh, authority. U.S. Forest Service, uh, they, they send a lot of technical expertise. Um, and, and then, of course, there should be another pie slice here because your town will be included in that as well. Um, we, we've, we've got plans already worked up um, for education and outreach programs. We've got an, an action plan prepared um, that identifies all the different uh, stakeholders, what their different roles are. Uh, so when the discovery is made, 
um, the, a lot of the groundwork's been set for our action or our response. Um, but a lot of people are curious, though, about the quarantine. And first of all, let me say that it's not here yet, so I can't tell you what our quarantine will be like. Um, but it will probably be very similar to what's already been imposed in other places. And, and in general, what the quarantine will do is it will name all the regulated materials. And, and that will include, I'm certain, uh, ash nursery stock, any part of an ash tree, limbs, twigs, bark, the bowl of the tree, the trunk of the tree, even the roots uh, will be regulated materials. Uh, green lumber uh, will be included, I'm certain. Um, any hardwood, firewood will probably be included, just judging from what's been done in other places. And, and what the quarantine will do after describing what the regulated materials are, it will put restrictions on the movement of those materials. The whole idea of a quarantine is to try to keep the bad stuff where it is, not to let it spread. Um, there will be some exceptions. I can tell you that um, I've been involved with this process here in Vermont for hemlock woolly adelgid, which is not a federally regulated insect, it's a state regulated insect. But we had to go through a similar uh, process to create an, a quarantine for hemlock woolly adelgid. And I can tell you from that experience that state uh, officials working in the case of EAB, working with the federal officials, will try to be as reasonable as possible with those movement restrictions in order to allow uh, the wood products industry and the nursery industry, those affected stakeholders, to try to still um, be active. Um, some of the typical exceptions for movement of regulated material um, <coughs> would include that um, materials, if they're heat treated or fumigated, can often be moved from the quarantine area, out of the quarantine area. I should say movement within the quarantine areas is almost unrestricted it, because that movement won't spread the infestation much. Um, but to go from within the infested, infested area the quarantined area outward. Um, if it's heat treated or fumigated and there are certain specs, it depends on what the product is and so forth, um, but there will be specifications very specifically lined out. Those places that do heat treating or fumigating or whatever will have to be certified by either the state or the federal agency. Um, the stuff usually has to be labeled um, that it has been certified and so forth. But that's one way that sometimes stuff can get moved. Yeah? Just curious, who will monitor all of this? Well, a, a great deal of it will fall on APHIS and the state agriculture agency. They're the primary ones involved with regulatory and quarantine issues. But, you know, all of us will end up helping. <laughs> Is that not well, I, satisfactory? I mean, you know, it's like a lot of other things, like, you know, that happen in the state where there are certain rules and regulations, but then once something occurs, the monitoring and processing of whatever the rules and regulations say, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it can be very loose. So, and, so and, and it's only because we don't have the, the money and manpower to do it. So, yeah, you're really getting to the issue of enforcement. Yes. And and there are there are financial fines and, and even criminal fine or criminal um, uh, what's the word penalty 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 thanks yeah uh, penalties uh, for violations of these federal quarantines. I don't have enforcement authority. Um, you know if I if I see if I see a truck going down the road, the best I can do is is, uh, you know, call up somebody that has that authority. And those are APHIS, the USDA, and, and our state ag people. And, you know, could the state give more money and hire more people? Well, I, I don't know. 
Yeah, it, it would be nice. I'm sorry, I see a lot of hands. First, back there. Well, you answered my question. I, I just, I was also curious about in the those uh, 14 areas in New York State that you were working in, people that were logging, um, and that was my question. How how do you know if the logs going out have been checked over or not? Because I was just mentioning uh, just recently on my in my area here in Vermont, which we don't have an infestation yet, but they were logging huge amounts. I mean, truck after truck, it just seemed like kept coming in. And I don't know who would be there in those kinds of instances to say, uh-uh, that stays, that goes. I just, a a I wonder about that. Yeah, APHIS does have people with regulatory powers and authority. So, so in those infestated areas, when somebody wants to log, they have to call APHIS and say, I'm logging, come and check it out, so I'm, I have comply with the law? No, no, logging isn't restricted. It's only the movement of the regulated materials. So, but so movement, <coughs> logging, we don't know where the trees are going to go to be. Well, well, that's 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 where they take great pains to try to set up quarantined areas that allow for uh, stuff to get to mills that use it, and and this is another part of the exceptions that allow restricted stuff to still move. In, in many places, uh, there are allowances. For instance, um, you know, say tomorrow it's discovered in, in uh, Wyndham County and an emergency quarantine is placed on Wyndham County. If you cut ash trees in Wyndham County, you could still take them to Sosasimo because it's within the, the quarantined area. But if you wanted to take them up to, you know, Canada or, well, that, that's too complicated. If you wanted to take them to another mill that was in another county. In many places, there are exceptions allowed so that those logs could be moved during the non-flight season of the insect. So if the insect's in the log when you cut the tree down, it's not ready to come out. And if, and if you can... Uh, get the log to a mill with a compliance agreement, and the compliance agreement might have stipulations that that will keep paperwork on where the wood came from, when it came, when it arrived, and we promise to debark it plus the half inch of wood on the outer part of the log. We need we promise to to mill it out and to burn all the slabs and all the chips before flight season. Then then that's those are exceptions that would allow the movement of those logs. So, so the regulating agencies try to not put undue restrictions on the industry. It, it's a balancing act. Um, we we want to keep the insect from spreading, but we want to allow the mills and the loggers to keep working. So, so there are, there are ways that, that they can, can make some exceptions. Seasonal movement, compliance agreements, uh, destruction of the debris, those sort of things are typical elements in those exceptions. I would argue that the loggers probably not. I wouldn't worry so much about the loggers. The mills, the <coughs> loggers are sending their lumber to mills that presumably have some kind of compliance agreement or I guess I guess I should maybe be careful what I say, but um, <laughs> And as far as the firewood goes, the firewood generally you're not trucking it very far at all, so maybe mostly irrelevant anyway. Um, I have a question about that firewood. I mean, and assuming you know we've all gone to gas stations, at grocery stores, and we see prepackaged bundles. It does. Oh, is it? Is it? Oh, because it never says where where it came from, and we're all taught not to bring firewood into a campground. You know, you never bring it from your area. And I always wonder, so well, could we possibly be getting infected wood from New York? In the past, that has been a primary vector for the movement of some of these pests. Um, educational efforts, we think, are beginning to have uh, an effect. I mean, you just mentioned that we're taught that. There's always a few people that don't pay attention to what they're taught. but. <laughs> Um, we believe that we're beginning to make an impact on the movement of firewood. Um, I, I think that, that an educational um, push 
for all of these kind of regulations will will be very very important because uh, people were asking about the enforcement. We don't have a lot of enforcement abilities, so we're going to have to do more on the educational side. And and you know, you and I as public citizens um, need to be able to put peer pressure on you know wood producers and say oh, it's not heat treated or oh it came from 700 miles away I'm not gonna buy it <coughs> someone was telling me about they found firewood for sale on Craigslist from Estonia what? how in the heck can you make money <laughs> shipping wood across the ocean but but it's out there and, and so you know we, we need to we need to just kind of stand up for, for what's right let me quickly just blitz through here so that um, we let you out on time. Um, but anyways, quarantines will affect us. We, the, the regulating agencies trying to minimize the effect, but in order to keep the bugs in one place, some restrictions have to be applied. And, and because the movement is restricted, often uh, disposal yards are a result. And, and disposal yards can be set up so that arborists or the local homeowner when, when their tree in their backyard dies and they cut it down to keep the kids playground safe you know they have a place to bring the infested wood legally um, you can usually just leave stuff on site you know the idea of leaving it on the roadside it may not be the best practice but it's legal um, so you could do that um, we will not be able to landfill the debris from infested ash trees after 2016. There's some new laws that have to do with solid waste and, and uh, putting organic material in landfills. And after 2016, uh, woody material and wood chips and stuff will not be allowed to be uh, put into landfills. The cool thing is, I, I spoke with um, the, I'm going to butcher the name, but the, no, the, 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 the Solid Waste Management District for Wyndham. Yeah, there you go. What she said. What she said. Um, and and because of this law, um, organic wastes are going to need to be composted, and they're actually looking for sources of what they call bulking agents to mix with all the food refuse and stuff to make it compost properly. And and our ground up. Uh, uh, ash material would be suitable for that. So there may actually be a market for this stuff, which is good news. Um, and we've already mentioned the idea of, of cooperative arrangements, but, but disposal yards can be done cooperatively. You know, several towns can pick a, a central spot and direct their, their citizens and, and arborists working in that town to send all their stuff to those to those central areas. Uh, when you do, uh, you do, and, and I can give you a, at a later time and date a more technical explanation of this, but uh, when you do set up a disposal yard, that material is considered solid waste and there will be some state permits, surprise, surprise, um, involved um, for wastewater and for solid waste, but they're not impossible. <laughs> um, and, and I, I would just direct you to the toolbox at vtinvasives.org. Um, there's there's uh, several uh, helpful documents. One is called Establishing a Local Debris Disposal Yard. And the reason I rushed through that one is to say that at the disposal yard, and you've seen this slide before, but at the disposal yard, we can make some decisions about whether or not infested trees go to a, dispo a disposal yard and whether they become low quality, low value chips or high quality products. If somebody with a little entrepreneurial, you know, uh, whatever that word is, uh, sense um, and a little forethought and some recognition that there's a problem coming, you can actually divert some of this and, and make lemonade out of lemons, I guess. Um, this again is from VT Invasives, just gives you a spectrum of some of the kind of products available. Everything from chips to firewood uh, to saw logs and specialty products. And, and check out all these links, you know, all these different, uh, the Vermont Art Network, 
the Vermont Hand Crafters Inc., the Guild of Vermont Furniture Makers. You, you can click on there and get a lot of information, you know, trying to do some demographic and market studies for your entrepreneurial idea. But, but what I hope to encourage people is to begin to recognize these opportunities and to begin doing that networking. And I've heard of companies out in uh, the Midwest who have been uh, buying and stockpiling ash so that they can continue to you know, provide their products um, even after most of the ash trees are gone. Um, if you begin to think through these different scenarios, uh, there are opportunities for people. You can burn it. This is uh, McNeil uh, up in Burlington, burning wood chips. Or you can run it through a mill and make some pretty snazzy stuff out of it. And this is a this is a picture. I hope you can see it. This is the Traverwood Reading Room in the Ann Arbor District Library, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And these are all ash trees. They were street trees that were stricken with emerald ash borer, and they were cut. But the town knew that they were going to be putting this addition onto their library. And so they, they planned to have the tree stems hold the roof up. All the flooring, all the shelves is all made out of ash from street trees that they cut down because of emerald ash borer. So if you think ahead, you know, I've heard about towns that, I've heard about towns that recognize every year we buy wood to make guardrails, every year we buy wood to redo the, the the benches in the park. Every year we buy wood to do this, this, this. And they said, you know, this year we're going to hire a guy and to go to our disposal yard and just rip us out a bunch of planks. Yeah. Before um, the infested wood gets, gets used for these purposes, it needs to be fumigated. How long does, does the insect live in this wood for how many no, no, after it's cut. Typical, typical life cycle is only one year anyways, occasionally two. But once the material, once a tree is cut down, there's no longer water and food flowing through there. So fairly soon, the insect would find its habitat unsuitable and it would die. Okay, it dies. It doesn't Good. Well, depending on season, it, it, it could survive long enough to mature and, and leave the log. But products like this can be used within the quarantine area without the need for fumigation or heat treatment or any of those other things. So uh, again, I just want to tell you that the planning worksheet itself, uh, the toolbox, they're all at btinvasives.org. Molly and I are available. My business cards are there. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here. I wish you well. I know you have different uh, functions and, and different situations, but whether it's a road crew or a town commission, a conservation commission, whatever, uh, if there are ways that we can help you uh, to go from here and, and get a specific plan or program going, uh, please let us know. That's, that's our job. But that finishes me. I would turn it back over to Kim. All right. Um, we can go for a walk for people that are interested. Jim has said that he would be willing to stick around for a while for anyone that has questions that they want to ask one-on-one. -on -one. Um, otherwise, we're five minutes, five minutes ahead of schedule, so feel free to to Walk, I'll, I'll explain some of the things that, that I see that draw my eye to this. One is the pattern of the bark. Molly mentioned that the, the ridges and fissures of the bark have a, a real diamond-like pattern, and you can see that pretty well in this one. Yeah. 
This is an ash tree. Very, very typical bar. Um, now the one behind the leaves. This one here is the ash. Oh, that that big thing is the white pine. Okay. Is that what you meant? Yeah. I'm just looking at two different parks. Yeah. It's, it's this one right here that I'm referring to. Yep. That's very, very typical ash bark. People call it diamond shaped. I, I, I kind of think of it, when I look at it, it reminds me of corrugated cardboard. Yeah. If you look on the end, it kind of looks corrugated. And it's a tighter weave kind of thing. This, this pine. Yeah. 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 So that's one, one, uh, Oh. I got a sinking feeling that would happen. <laughs> that's why I didn't go there. <laughs> that's cause. one of the identifying features is that is that bark. Let me show you another, and that is the twigs themselves. This is a good example. The, the, the leafing and twig pattern on ash trees is such that, that twigs or, or leaves uh, come out opposite of each other. So here we have two that are opposite, two that are opposite, two that are opposite. So opposite branching is, is a feature of ash trees that, that help identify them. Now, is that unique to ash or not? No, no. in fact, I wanted to show you this this big tree here and these these branches that come out um, see their their branches and twigs come out opposite of each other but that's a maple so <laughs> maples ashes dogwoods um, all have opposite branching so you have to but, combine the bark and the opposite twig the, yeah yeah but you know a lot of like oak trees um, hickories butternuts uh, their branches alternate and, uh, a twig will come out one side and then you go up a little bit and the next twig comes out on the other side so there's alternate and opposite ashes are opposite they have this corrugated kind of a bark and and what drew my eye to those trees across the parking lot was just that the the twigs are very stout um, and and thick and, and that's because the leaves on ash trees are actually uh, compound leaves. Of course, there aren't any out right now, but let me bring you over to my other uh, laptop printer. Um, the, yeah. But the, leaf, the leaflets come off the twigs opposite one another as well. Yeah, yeah, there's better pictures. But, but in these pictures, each of these little things is a leaflet. The entire thing is a leaf. And botanically, it has to do with where the bud is found. There, there are no buds at the base of these leaflets. The, the bud is down here at the base of this stalk. So this whole thing is a leaf. It's known as a compound leaf. And, and because, because they have compound leaves, the twigs are stout. This stalk of the compound leaf almost acts like a another uh, branch uh, of, a, of a twig, you know. So, so the twigs on, on the ash trees are a little stout. Um, they're often, the tree itself is often very erect. Uh, and, and you just begin to get a sense of what they look like, you know. Like anything, it just takes a little experience. Um, but I can rule out some trees when I look at them that, for instance, uh, hickory and elm often have bark that look like ash bark, but they're alternately branched. Um, maples, the bark is usually different, but they have alternate, or excuse me, opposite branches. So, you know, you... You just got to go slow at first, you begin to get used to, to things, and, and when you look at two or three different parts of the tree, and you can begin to put together a sense of it. For instance, um, I'm seeing now out there in the distance, if you go right out there, there's 
the hemlock tree, the softwood tree, with the branches that come down low. But then there's a big, large tree with a sunlit base that leans out a little bit and then goes all the way up there. That's an ash tree. Can, can you see the, the pattern on the bark? And then look up, you see how those, those branches come out opposite and, and they're real stout. When you're looking at that top and move over this way into that maple top, you can see the big round bugs. The, the ash bugs don't stand out like that. So, so this, this is a, a red maple and those big round buds just stand out. After a while, you just begin to get a sense of, of these, you know, it just takes a little practice. It's kind of fun to just go out by yourself when there's no pressure and maybe have a little guide with you begin to learn this stuff and, and then pretty soon it just becomes second nature so if we look back up at the top of that ash tree again and then just move over to the next big big hardwood crown those are pretty stout looking twigs but they're alternate each other and and if you come down the bark is all you almost want to say it looks kind of corrugated but the the ridges are quite a bit wider than the ridges on on the ash and, and that's an oak tree. A f there's a few remnant leaves up there, and, and oak trees often um, have very persistent leaves, and, and so often that's another, just a little, a little trick that sometimes you notice it and you know what it means. And of course, then there's a smaller one closer to us with the white bark. That's a birch tree. My observation has been that the ash trees tend to leaf out later and they'll drop their leaves earlier. Uh, that's that's exactly right, yeah. So in the springtime, often a lot of the other trees have already begun to leaf out and, and you can drive down the road and you just pick out the, the leafless ash tops. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's it. It's not rocket science. It's, it's a lot of fun to learn it and pick it up and once you know it, it's pretty useful. Any Any questions or thoughts or anything? Anything else I can try to show you? I wish we had a, a, a Norway maple here. Yes. Because that's <laughs> Th that is it's more of a village tree and the bark the, can confuse people. The bark is very close to ash and it happens to be oppositely branched as well. In those cases, look for those big round uh, buds. Look at the color of the twigs. And, and the smoothness of the bark on the top of the ridges, uh, often the Norway bark is smoother than the top of the ridges on the ash bark. Thank you for that. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. I got a quick question. The best indicators to tell the difference between the three different types of ash. Oh, sure. Is that more of a summertime thing? No, no, not necessarily. Um, the black <laughs> ash is typically found in real moist conditions and the bark is real spongy you can mm -hmm. you can push the bark in and it'll it'll really give a lot mm -hmm. and then between green and white it's a, a, one way to tell without leaves is by looking at the buds and, and these bud stars um, well, I need to break this off black ash is spongy and then obviously flat and dark hardwood too, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so anyways. Okay, well, here, whoop. Oh, no, I did it. Didn't, didn't mean to do that. It was an accident. But you can see this, this flat place here, with the, it looks like a little smiley face. Yeah. That's that's where the petiole from the leaf came off last last year. Okay, it's gone now, so that's called the leaf scar. And on the leaf scar of a white, um, it, it's it's kind of U-shaped, and this little brown bump right here, right there, mm -hmm. that's the actual bud for next year's leaf. Okay. Well, this this season's leaf that's coming. And, and notice the way it cuts down into the bud scar in a, in a real sharp way? Yeah. That's white ash. The, the green ash is, is not, it doesn't create that kind of a V shape. Oh, wow, okay. It's more rounded. Exactly. I don't get it. Yeah. 
Huh. And so, there are there are other, you know, small things, but I go by buds. Okay. Uh, by the leaves, um, some of the leaflets have little stalks on them, some don't. Um, sometimes the number of leaflets on a particular leaf vary, but and so there's sort of guidelines, and and the guidelines for green and that and white might vary, but from tree to tree. It's it's not that none of those are, are stamped in stone, you right, know. Right. So so it's harder to go by those. So the best way to tell is actually when it's dormant. And look, well, looking at that. Well, for me, yeah. for me, the buds yeah. are, are are easy and, and quite diagnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, you could probably you could probably still tell. I mean, you could just pull the the petiole off. There's a a real good book on that, and I can't think of the name of it. But if you if you go on a There's one for trees, there's one for identifying trees in winter conditions, and that's, uh, boy, I wish I could think of the name of it. There's one for bushes also, but it's it's a series. Yeah. And I don't know what you would uh, it it? go to to research it, but uh, I found them on uh, Amazon. Uh-huh. But if if you go if you go online, um, I'm not sure if the VT Invasives has it or not. But uh, there's a place called EAB Info or EAB University, and either one of those places, if you go in there and just do a little bit of navigating around, it'll talk about tree ID as well, and and it'll have you know really nice pictures of different barks. Oh, another another easy way to tell is the fruits. The Samaras are different. Oh, okay. Obviously okay. different. So, so Obviously you know, different. Okay. yeah, you 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 can distinguish them. It just takes just a little bit of study and practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Glad you're here.